This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with James O'Brien. It's three minutes after ten and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. <laughs> You're very funny. I tell you what, I love it when I start the show with a giggle because I've started scrolling through a couple of your texts. Terry's been in touch. So you're wondering where the helicopter is, James. This was with regard to the horses that are on the loose in London. He says Rishi Sunak's probably using it. Have I told you about the provenance, uh, the background of some of the people who've either paid for Rishi Sunak's helicopters or... or uh, or lend them to him. It, it's a it's a it's a pretty rum business, actually. Can you remind me? Oh, that was on my list of things to tell you about. Rishi Sunak's helicopters. Will you will you remind me to uh, to tell you about that a little later in the program? I've got post-it notes coming out of my ears, and I always forget to write on them. Um, and the second one I saw, I think this came in on Nick's watch rather than mine, but it still stands. Uh, it said, "It's just some horses, for goodness' sake." Regards the countryside and I, I i laughed at that and then i found myself thinking look if you had five double decker buses careering through the narrow lanes of the cotswolds or the yorkshire moors then you probably would be uh a little bit discombobulated by it as well and and i do appreciate that the majority of people listening to this program are not going to be in central london or indeed any 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 part of london but it but it, it nonetheless is is it's it's man bites dog territory as opposed to dog bites man territory, even though it involves horses. Uh, so if you're just tuning in, at about 20 to 9 this morning, the City of London police have said they were called about some horses that had become loose and were travelling through the city. Uh, our officers have contained two horses on the highway near Limehouse, and we're waiting for an army horse box to collect these horses and transport them to veterinary care. It is believed that some are still on the loose and uh, we will well Henry Riley's out there trying to catch one so we'll, we'll we'll catch up with Henry the horse herder a little later in the program I see these horses most days because um, uh, I cycle to work at the moment I don't know how long it's going to last I, I, I'm not going to become a sort of holier than thou health evangelist I think that's highly unlikely but goodness me it puts you in a good mood if the if the weather is nice and as I come through Hyde Park I, I see the household cavalry and I think it's the household cavalry anyway I see soldiers on horses every day. Yesterday, I saw some Shire horses, which I presume go back to the First World War, don't they? You think of the Michael Morpurgo book, War Horse, and the magnificent National Theatre production. So they still have Shire horses. One presumes for ceremonial purposes. They're no longer dragging cannons around and the like, but but tradition and, and ceremony, which, of course... Is, uh, is, 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 is a large part of our heritage. Six minutes after ten is the time. Uh, they are just normal horses, writes Rena, innocent horses. Um, and Alex says, shouldn't it be horse rides man as opposed to man rides horse? It's not quite horse rides man, but, but they are on the loose. And Ruby writes, it's typical of London. You wait ages for one horse to escape and then three escape at the same time. Uh, listen, you have to hope because a, a, a spooked horse... Is, is quite a dangerous thing. So you have to hope that this episode concludes with no damage or harm done to either horse or human. And, I, and the last word on this, it won't be the last word, will it? Nigel's been in touch. Uh, Nigel, what a lovely name, Nigel Honey. Uh, he says, are they ULES, ULES compliant, James, these horses? I suppose it depends what they had for dinner last night or indeed breakfast, Nigel. But um, I, it, it, I, think, I think we should be told. Seven minutes after ten is the time. This story upset me more than I expected it to when I read the headline. Um, Pandemic school starters will do worse at GCSEs. And I, 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 I kind of found myself thinking, well, every cohort of exam takers is judged against everybody else taking the exams at the same time. So this isn't necessarily quite as upsetting as it is designed to be as a headline teachers may well tell us differently in the course of the hour but as i read further into the story which draws upon a study published today by academics from the universities of exeter strathclyde and the lse it looks at how school closures during covid19 hindered children's development at age 5 11 and 14 and in some ways it's the youngest of those cohorts that caused me the most concern. That's what I mean about the headline not really conveying the full detail of the story. Because they are suffering in every way. They're suffering academically and they are suffering in terms of 
social skills, uh, a particularly adverse impact on the academic and social skills of children in their formative years. Uh, if you are just starting school, if you started school during the pandemic, you will have worse GCSE examination results because of the prolonged damage wrought by school closures, according to this study. It, it's, it's really sad reading. That's the word I use. It's not a word we use often on the programme, but it seems to fit perfectly here. It's sad reading. Researchers found that cognitive skills at age five are highly predictive of cognitive skills later in childhood. And girls aged five during the pandemic are 4.8 percentage points less likely to achieve five good GCSE. So, you know, they're relatively small margins, but big enough to be notable. Pupils who were five at the start of the first lockdown, how old do you think they'd be today? How, how easy do you find it to do the internal calendar on the lockdowns and the pandemic? It all blurs a bit in my brain. And I was relating, uh, supposedly, reporting the news at the time. So if my brain has blurred, goodness knows what's happened to yours. If I had to pin down precisely when that bit started and that bit ended and when we couldn't go for a walk beyond a certain uh, radius of our own home and when I, I we used to the, certainly couldn't do the months but do you know I'd struggle to do the years I said to you now if you were five when the pandemic started how old would you be now what would you say go on say a number okay yeah all right well nine it, 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 so that probably would be a a, a popular guess or, or a popular calculation but fewer than four in ten pupils come 2030 are expected to achieve grade five or above in english and mathematics um and normally that figure would be much higher uh, i i've got a couple of questions about this the f i think i want to look at social skills more than academics and and that's just one of the cohorts that they have analyzed they've looked at children at age five eleven and 14, children who, who were those ages at the beginning of the pandemic, 5, 11, and 14. And I'm interested in how the social skills have been affected because I don't know how you know. I think teachers would find it easier to tell than parents because parents don't have the tools, really, to determine why their child is behaving in a certain way. We took a call a, a couple of months ago from a lady who... Couldn't come on air, actually. Uh, Eleanor told me about it after the program. Um, and she was talking about children being nasty to each other. She was talking about the children arriving. This, this category of kid, the five-year-old at the beginning of pandemic, who's turned nine now, arriving at primary school or working their way through primary school and just being, being a lot meaner to each other than previous generations of children would have been. And, and it struck me when we were talking about this earlier that a parent wouldn't know that. A parent wouldn't know that. A parent wouldn't have the frame of comparison. If you've got two children or three children, then you know that sometimes the year in which they find themselves at school can be very different and quite defining. You might have one child. You hear parents talk about this sometimes. They say, oh, our oldest was in a lovely year or our youngest was in a lovely year, but the oldest had quite a tough time. So you don't have the frame of reference. There's the phrase I was looking for. You can always hear me groping sometimes for the right words. A frame of reference. Do parents have a frame of reference to really get stuck into this subject. I don't know if they do. And then, of course, you've got the oldest parental impulse of all, which is the temptation to believe that your little treasure is incapable of poor behaviour or indeed immune to de developmental problems. So you've got, you've got a couple of problems, if you like, for parents when it comes to analysing the extent of this issue. But we can't. Ignore it, and we have to take it seriously. One of the report authors says poorer GCSE results will scar successive cohorts of children well into the 2030s, signalling a decline in the country's social mobility levels. Um, I, 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 I was going to ask what we can do to improve things, but I actually think, now that we're embarked upon this course, I, I, I'm going to ask how you know. How do you know? 0345 How do you know that your child, or if you're a teacher, the children in your care, have been harmed by the school closures during the pandemic? 
0345 is the number that you need. What, what are you looking at? What are you seeing? What is the evidence that you would point to? Because they're quite vague terms, aren't they? Social skills. But if you say, I've been a primary school teacher for, for 20 years, and the kids coming through who were stuck at home during pandemic, and it's not just the kids who were stuck at home because the schools were closed. It's the kids who were stuck at home more than they would have been, even though they hadn't started school yet. The da- what, what, are you, what are you seeing that you haven't seen before? Is it things like eye contact? Is it things like sociability, community, a, a, a sharing? What, what, I think we'll start young and possibly work our way up. But what are you seeing and what challenges does it present to you as a, as a teacher or a parent? How do we know that this behaviour that we think is problematic or sad or whatever word you want to deploy, how do we know that it's a consequence of those school closures? It's a consequence of the privations of the pandemic response. I, I really hope we can find our way into this story because as i said the headline sent me off in one direction pandemic school starters will do worse at gcse's but the detail sent me in a different direction entirely a very sad direction looking at children who were five at the start of pandemic um being in a right old pickle when it comes to a whole array of things that i think we would once have taken for granted so let's do the evidence i think rather than the explanations or the answers what do we see what do you see that makes you think, do you know what? That this is actually different. And I, I can't prove causation. I, I can only show correlation. But I would be deeply surprised if the reason why these children are behaving in this way was not because of the privations they endured during lockdowns and school closures. So I, I know it's tough to tell sometimes about, about your own children, but you're either thinking now, yeah, that's it, James, I can help you with this. Or you may be thinking... Oh, goodness me, that's what it is. I, you know, I hadn't clocked that before. Especially if, you, you know, if you're one of those parents that's got quite a big gap between children. So you can compare a pre-pandemic childhood with a post-pandemic childhood. And you're going, good grief, that's, that might be why. That might be why the little one is so different from the older one. It's 10.16. James O'Brien on LBC. 18 minutes after 10. I know they say the pictures are better on the radio, but I think that the challenge of conveying to you the impact of, of footage of these horses that are on the loose in London, one of them apparently covered in blood, uh, I, I think that I may not be up to that challenge, although um, I, I'll have a go a little later and uh, hopefully Henry Riley will be able to report back to us about what is going on on the, on the streets of London, where City of London police confirm that two horses have been contained, but as far as I can tell, there, there, there are still some others on the loose. The problem is, you get enough eyewitness reports. If the horses are moving quickly enough, you might get two eyewitness reports that sounds like there's four horses, but in fact it's the same two horses. They've just covered quite a lot of ground quite quickly. So it could be the same two horses running up and down, running around London and, and getting allegedly spotted in multiple different ways. 19 after 10 is the time um children social skills pandemics school closures christy's in barnet to knit them all together christy what would you like to say oh hello um so i'm a reception teacher have been for nine years etc um in so covid happened the kids came back yeah. the year they came back academically it was fine maths literacy they were reading obviously parents did things at home with their kids like reading books is absolutely fine okay. however there was a drop in making relationships um, and we saw that quite significantly for two years after. So tell me what um, that means on the ground or in the classroom. Cause, cause what that means in the classroom is the children find it difficult to interact with each other. So, number one, people would say, well, no, no, that's because of um, their language. I don't have that. But we found, and I found, I've been a reception teacher for years, yeah. is that it's the confidence. They didn't have the confidence to interact with each other, to talk to each other. And it, was only, um, and it really affected them, actually, because... Not only does it affect themselves, yeah. I had one child for the whole year that couldn't make any friends, he couldn't talk to anyone, and I was really concerned. I spoke to mum and dad, and I never yeah. ever mentioned the COVID thing. I, I gave them um, options, I gave them ideas. I said, um, I, said gave, I gave numbers, and I said, yeah. parents, I said, make a group, have play dates, do that, get them involved. But what I did find was parents were very sceptical about it themselves, and they said, oh no, it's COVID or COVID. I said, no, I appreciate that. However, this is a time now 
that we need to get our children back in there. And it's okay to play with other children. That's okay. But the children seem very nervous to do that. So not only is that um, learned behavior of parents, that is for the fact that they have been stuck inside, not being able to be along other children. Because for me, I'm a big, I work in a school. However, I don't teach nursery. I teach reception, but I'm a big advocate of nursery. How do we, how do we know that, how do we know that the child wouldn't have been like that anyway? Because some children are um, well, a bit solipsistic, aren't they? They're a bit, they're, yeah. they're, they're a bit self-contained. They, they are. They're, some children yeah. are very shy. How, how do we? And I, I know we don't well, know, no, no. But what makes you think that that is the link? Well, at the end of the day, like, we we do home visits in reception. So we go to the house. They come to us. We yeah. kind of get a sense of what parents are like. I'll be honest with you. When you have a sense of what parents are like, that again is taught behaviour. If a mum is a bit off and you think mm, that's why a child is like that however <laughs> being i can't solitary, imagine you go double-handed you know right you go you go you two of you go for the home visits usually yeah it depends yeah it depends i bet you gossip like the clappers on the way yeah, we, i bet yeah, well, I'm not nev- say that, i know you're not going to mm. say that but that has never crossed my mind before i remember our home visits i hope i hope we weren't yeah. the people that you'd be you'd be mithering about in the pub afterwards but oh no 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 me. we don't do that we don't no, do of course that you don't. Is, yeah right yeah pull the other like, one it's got bells on so go on so you might yeah. have a hint that yeah, if a child a is hint. yeah fair enough yes but however when you know like it's, it, this has now been like two three years and we still see it of a sense of oh no it's covid i didn't go nurse you understand that it was closed everything, everything uh. like that. but the children are finding it so hard to just and we have to model so much we've modeled so much on how to play together like me Te- and my teaching children to play together, which yes. is not something you would have had to do before because they would have organically well, exactly. developed those skills. Well, exactly. there it is. That's a jackpot. Early doors and, in and terms that's, of what we're what looking we for this like morning. My, my teaching assistant all the time, I'm like, I want to use you, let's do that. Um, and we do a lot of that sharing, being kind, using kind words, what language you use, modern in sentences, because they were not sure how to do it. They were very nervous. I'll keep saying nervous because it was. They and were very like... It was kind of like a bit shell shocked. Oh, what do I no, do? What do yeah, I do? No, I hear you. I've got I, a lot how of is the lad? How, how is the lad you started off talking about? How, have, have you managed um, to help him a bit? Or? Well, the whole year he found it difficult, right. and I was concerned. Um, then, like I said, I had a link with a parent there, and I thought, mm, she's very kind of close herself. Okay. But then I pushed the whole, come on, play groups, let's do that, do that. We did. She did that, and yeah. slowly but surely, he's oh, well um, getting there. He is getting there, but again, he's very quiet. Yeah, very and, quiet, and that's and that's I, part of the problem, isn't it? Because some children are very quiet, and they would be very quiet if we'd never heard of coronaviruses. But but you, I mean, for for the record, Christy, it sounds like you're a lovely teacher. It really does. Sounds like you really go could go the distance for the children and to care about the, these sort of extra welfare issues is a, is, a, is a voluntary decision to add to your already considerable burdens. 23 minutes after 10. This is from Peter. OMG, James, I think you're talking about me. My little girl is nine and her emotions are up and down a lot lately, lately so I'm starting to wonder if these COVID years have had something to do with it. We were also a shielding family, so that might have affected us more. In other words, even more isolated. And I I think Idiot's Corner for you, John, although it's not a slam dunk in the way that some are. John's decided to get in touch in response to some research that has been undertaken um, with great care and detail over a period of years by the Universities of Exeter, Strathclyde and the London School of Economics. John's got in touch to say, what absolute balderdash. Every week of my early school days, I spent two or three days off school owing to asthma. My parents smoked 40 to 60 cigarettes a day. I sat at home reading books. When I was well, my interaction with other children never suffered, and in my teens I had dozens of friends of both genders. My work life didn't suffer, possibly owing to my different educational upbringing. I was commissioned by the BBC as a comedy scriptwriter. Some perspective, please. I find it very hard to believe that you were commissioned by the BBC as a comedy scriptwriter because you sound like a completely miserable old git. But you never know. Comedy can sometimes come from the most unlikely places. But guess what, John? If you'd never had a cold, right, it wouldn't mean that the common cold did not exist and that millions of people all around the world since time immemorial had suffered from the common cold. So your personal anecdotal experience does not sit on the other side of the scales to um, carefully considered research conducted uh, by examining the experiences of thousands of children and then explained in great detail in an academic paper. What do you think this is, Brexit? 25 after 10 is the time. Nicola is in Manchester. Nicola, what would you like to say? Hey, James. Um, so my son is 17 now. He's in lower sixth form, so he's in year 12. 
Um, he was 14 during the pandemic in year nine. Yes. Um, the GCSE results last year were horrendous. They were horrendous. Um, so he, his cohort, their uh, uh, grade boundaries were all lifted back to pre-pandemic. Yes. And their teachers had been told right till the last minute that their grade boundaries were going to be the same as the previous year to reflect COVID. And then that didn't happen. They I remember I remember this. It was... it, and was, it was a bloodbath. Yeah. And, and it was <laughs> odd because I, I, I tried to explain this this morning because I, 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 if I was in charge, which admittedly would be a fairly terrifying prospect for anybody sensible, but if I was in charge, it seemed fairly straightforward to me that you'd, you'd just give... You'd, you'd spread the grades out, so you'd give yeah. you'd give the nine or the or the A star or the whatever it is these days to the to the top five percent, and the next grade down to the yeah. next five percent. I'd just have done it like that, but then of course it means that someone getting a top grade this year wouldn't have got a top grade last year. So it introduces an element of unfairness, but yeah. I, I could live with that unfairness because of the damage the alternatives do to children like your boy. And the problem with it is that now he's in year 12 and he's expecting to do his A-level, res- uh, his A-level exams next year is he has no faith in the system that he's oh, raised, bless to be him. And a lot of his friends feel the same. And socially, I would say, although it hasn't affected his confidence, I'll tell you what he's doing at the moment because I'm just on the way to pick him up. Um, <laughs> a lot of his friends find that they can't even make a phone call. Everything is done by WhatsApp or text message. Yeah, but that was always... I don't think that's the lockdown. That's not the lockdown. It's definitely worse. Well, we don't know that. We don't know that. uh, I can't be doing with voice notes. I can't be doing with voice notes. Someone sends me a voice note. In case you're wondering why I haven't replied, I'm not going to listen to it. I can't be doing with a voice note. Send me a text. So that's not that's not because of lockdown. It's because I'm old and miserable. But he is. I'll tell you the other thing that's affecting the year 12 students, so the kids that were 14 is that now, because so many people work from home, if you're looking to get work experience in a non-practical job, in an office-based job, you cannot, it is nearly impossible. Josh has spent two years trying to get work experience, and he's now had to take three days off school this week to go to accommodate some work experience because it's been nearly impossible. So... He's well, I'd never thought of that. I'd never thought so. All sorts of things that are going unremarked and and unnoticed. And just in case John's going to get in touch to tell me he once met someone who had managed to find some work experience, therefore this is all complete rubbish. Save your tuppence, John. Seriously, spend it on comedy writing lessons. Although I have to say, my good friend Nick Revel, one of the funniest people I know, has been in touch to say, "Point of order, Mister O'Brien. All comedy writers are miserable gits." He, he does he does raise a valid point. Uh, Henry Riley is out and about. Uh, it, 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 here's a line I never thought I'd say on the radio. Henry Riley, LBC's reporter, has just spoken to a man whose Mercedes was hit by a horse. There are two things that strike me about that line. The first is, good grief. And the second is, if it wasn't a Mercedes, it would just say car, wouldn't it? Henry Riley has spoken to a man whose car was hit by a horse. But it was no ordinary car, Henry. It was a Mercedes. And it was a Mercedes people carrier as well. It was a, a very nice Mercedes with blacked out windows. Um, this happened outside the Claremont Hotel, which is in Victoria, Buckingham Palace Road. And I've seen some footage from CCTV that someone showed me where there are three horses that just bolt towards this man's car and end up going into his windows. Um, More on that in just a moment. But as far as we know, James, the latest is that there are potentially as many as five horses that are on the loose in central London, two of which have now been contained. City of London police saying they managed to contain two of them near Limehouse. The Met Police also saying that they are aware of this incident. Um, Earlier on, I spoke with Tyne, who actually saw the event unfold. I saw the horses come charging down Lower Virgo Street here. One of the horses hit the Mercedes van and the rider was on it, fell back on this little... um, Yeah, sort of middle bit of the road. middle bit of the road there. And the other woman lost control of her horse and she managed to grab the railings. The other horse was bolted. was she dressed as? The lady who grabbed the horse? Was Um, she... You know the, Queen, the Queen's Cavalry, yeah. yeah. The other horse charged straight down and hit one of the buses. Yeah. Um, smashed the whole front of the windscreen. Of the bus? Yeah, of the bus. And you, we've seen some blood on some of the horses. Yeah, yeah the Did, horses were injured, obviously, from the glasses. From the that Mercedes? They'd broken. Yeah, the Mercedes and the bus as well. Um... And did, did you see the soldier who got thrown off? Yeah, he was laying there on the ground and he looked like he hurt himself pretty bad. So, 
Yeah, it was terrible. There's a little bay in between the uh, two bits of road on Buckingham Palace Road, James, where that's where the soldier was thrown off his particular horse. It's believed that was the white horse that ended up uh, going into a Mercedes van. And there's some uh, pretty distressing images online where that horse is clearly injured and clearly not in a good way. And the Mercedes van that has just left the scene um, has blood on it as well. So it, it's a very sad scene that, that's here just outside Victoria Station. Faraz was the man who was driving the Mercedes. He was parked outside the Claremont Hotel. He was waiting for a client. And he explains the moment where he realised what had happened. Can you just tell me what happened? So were you sat in the Mercedes? Is it your car? That's my car, yeah. I was just sitting in the car to pick my passenger. But the, on the other side, there was a, like a... I didn't see when the horse hit my car, then I see... It's, I was like a smash, senseless. That's uh, the people just came out of my car and they checked, you okay? Now I was uh, okay, but it's damaged. Then we stopped the, all the traffic and the one uh, military guy that's uh, was fell down on the, this island. Did, did you see the horses before they smashed your windows? Or no. did you, so you heard that yeah. first? I just like a shock when they, my car was on the two in the air on from the one side, it was on the air and then boom, because it, it hit them very hardly. They were booked and then done. How many horses did you see? I see about three, four horses, which I see. And uh, the, I think the white horse uh, uh, hit my car. And that's the blood? That's, on that's the, the blood of the, yeah. And he told me it happened at around half past eight this morning. So we know two of the horses have definitely been found, been captured by City of London police. There are still potentially uh, two, if not three, on the loose somewhere in London. Um, good grief. So I, I have to put out the APB if you, if you think you're seeing one, then do, do let us know. Um, uh, it's, uh, we know that uh, an army spokesperson, Henry, has said a number of military working horses became loose during routine exercise this morning. All of the horses have now been recovered and returned to camp. So I think, I think you can probably clock off. A number oh. of personnel and horses have been injured and are receiving the appropriate medical attention. I've got one question, though. That's happy news. Oh, no. When you asked that eyewitness what, what the horse rider was dressed as, what were you, I mean, did you think they might have been in fancy dress or did you heard rumours that they were riding around London in, uh, I don't know, dressed as Batman and Robin or something? What, dressed as? <laughs> no, well, yeah, yeah, that's probably not that I meant. To, I was, suppose I was trying to ascertain whether they had a uniform on because oh, I, I heard they, they were potentially a soldier, but dressed, you're right, Britney maybe not Spears, the best expression. But dressed Britney yeah. Spears, take a posh ginger spice during the Union flag years. I don't know what quite, but I see what you mean. You were trying to establish whether they were in uniform or not. Yes, exactly. Yes. Okay, well, happy, happily, it would appear that this curious episode has come to a, uh, a safe and peaceful conclusion, about which I think we can all be grateful. Uh, 33 minutes after 10 is the time. Amelia Cox is here with the headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. 37 is the time. Some breaking news for you. Queen Camilla and the Prince and Princess of Wales have all received historic royal honours, Buckingham Palace have announced. Prince William becomes Great Master of the Order of the Bath. Uh, Catherine is now a companion of honour, which recognises achievement in arts, medicine, sciences and public service, and the Queen becomes the Grand Master of the Order of the British Empire, once held by the King's father, Prince Philip, and Grandfather George VI. So I, I'm sure you'll join me in offering all of them the, the most hearty congratulations on those um, fantastic achievements. Um, the Queen, Camilla, and the Prince and Princess of Wales receiving historic royal honours uh, from... Uh, their, well, I suppose respectively, their husband, their dad and their father-in-law. Uh, isn't life grand? 10.38 is the time. I just said Keith was thinking about the insurance underwriter who's going to get the claim from that bloke that Henry just spoke to. From Raz, was it? So, it's a Firaz, what, what's happened to your car? Got hit by a horse. It, it reminds me of the best ever call in to LBC, which sadly wasn't on my show. It was on someone else's. His name eludes me. But the, uh, but, but, but the caller was explaining how he used to be a Remainer and uh, something had happened to change his mind. And the, the presenter, you could hear the presenter preening because he thought that the caller was going to say, yes, it was you. It was your wonderful Brexit rhetoric and um, arguments. As he goes, oh, and what was it then? What was it that prompted you to change your mind? And the caller went, I got hit by a head. I got hit in the head by a horse. But the, but, but the beauty of it, it was, it was the timing. It came out of nowhere and it was so perfectly plausible. It sounded like a professional prankster. Um, my favourite, probably my favourite ever call to... Uh, 
uh, to, to the entire radio station. And good to know I've had some good ones. 10.39 is the time, and long may it continue, because today's phone-in is about children affected by school closures. Um, we've heard from a, a reception teacher describing essentially a, de- a decline in social skills, a, a marked decline in social skills. We heard from another who's been back in touch, actually, uh, a, a reception teacher describing bad behaviour, not just shyness and uh, quietness and, uh, and, and d- difficulty in making connections, but an actual unpleasantness, a, a meanness, a nastiness. I suppose there'd be symptoms of the same malaise, wouldn't they? Difficulty to make connections on the one hand and on the other uh, uh, because you, can't, you're not, you haven't learnt good social skills, you have perhaps learnt bad ones. So what do you... Uh, what do you report? What would you describe, either as a teacher or a parent, as evidence that these privations have had a negative effect on children that is going to stay with us for generations? Ailey is in Edinburgh. Ailey, what, what made you pick up the phone? Hi there. Um, Hello. I, I just wanted to speak about my daughter. So she's basically what you what you were describing, I can really kind of um, uh, relate to. So she's nearly 16 now and she's just about to go through her exams. Um, She was 11 at the time of the pandemic Um, and so she was in the last year of primary school. Um, Just before lockdown, she was kind of getting pulled out and they were doing um, assessments whether she maybe had dyslexia. And we as parents kind of thought that they had dealt with that and the right things were in place for her then going to high school. Obviously, March, the lockdown, um, she missed the whole um, end of um, primary school and then the beginning of the high school, you know, like the normal kind of what you would normally get. Um, So we just kind of thought that everything was in place. Obviously, fast forward four years, she's been completely let down. She's found her own ways of coping through high school. Um, She's asked every teacher for pink paper because it actually helps her read. Mm. It's just come out in December that actually she needed purple paper. Um, And um, she's just had the tests to see if she was dyslexic or not. They're saying that there just, is a just, low just remind me how this is pandemic specific. So I, I just feel like the teachers at the time when she was in the last year of primary school completely slowed down. You, you know when it was the good weather and everyone kind of like lost their ambitions and were outside enjoying the garden. I feel like probably teachers did that as well. And, and, and was she and being taught online at the time? Was, was, was she being taught online at the time? Yeah. So that so so that ability, I I, mean, I don't necessarily I, I I don't want to contradict you, but it, it, it would be harder perhaps for the teachers to be on the ball well, with specific needs than it would be if they were in front of you. Yeah, I agree with that. But the ball was already rolling, and the fact that it's just stopped somewhere along the line, the message hasn't got from primary school to secondary yeah. school, and we were completely unaware of it. I I, I, I think so. So her first year, to... her first year at secondary school was during the pandemic. Uh, I, they're the kids I feel sorriest for. Yeah, I, th- I think I, I feel like that's the ones, the five-year-olds and the eleven-year-olds. They're the ones that have really, because we've got a um, nearly fourteen-year-old, and he seems to have sailed through it. He was just at that age where nothing would really have phased him. Isn't that so interesting? It, so the, 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 it's yeah. the seminal moments. If the seminal moments were not social if you weren't in school for the seminal moments then it's going to affect you socially and academically isn't it because no one had a map really to to navigate this kind of territory in the circumstances that families found themselves in yeah and the whole first year they've you know they've got certain things organized to integrate them into high school none of the kids got that so it it will affect our social skills as well and like our daughter she finds it hard with friendships and and things like that as well and i've got no doubt that that is part of nor have i now you know i've got no doubt either but neither of us could prove it could we in court no that's the thing no we can't prove it no but it's just sad that we're in this this situation now where her her exams are in like a you know next week and she's not got the arrangements in place to help her we we just found out that she should have had 25% extra time in any assessment since the beginning of high school 
and we found that out last week. Yeah, and and again, I, you know, you're not going to. Neither of us could prove that was a consequence of of pandemic experiences rather than a sort of broader malaise. But that doesn't really matter to her, does it? Because she has been let down. The whys and the whats of it are, are, are scant consolation. It another element of the research that's get caught my eye is the idea that socio-emotional skills which include the ability to cooperate with others to show empathy which i suppose brings us back to uh brings us back to to old john describing it all as complete balderdash so what you didn't realize john i'm sorry to pick on you mate but i, I for some reason i just found that the idea of a, a, a research involving the lives of 19,000 children who suffered in an unprecedented fashion from measures that were brought in in good faith and and for at the time, good reason to, to prompt such a negative response to you is proof that you were actually damaged by the privations of your childhood because you lack empathy, you see? So it, it is the ability to cooperate with others, to show empathy, to maintain attention. These are all as important as cognitive skills such as reading and writing. Um, and, and, and not just in life, but in achieving good GCSE grades and earning decent wages after school. This is heartbreaking in a way. If you, if you, if you have not developed socioeconomic, so I beg your pardon, socio-emotional skills, it will have a socio-economic impact. So tell me how you know what makes you fear that the school closures have hindered your child's socio-emotional skills. And that's where we come back to the teacher who told us a while ago about children not being very nice to each other, the lack of empathy. The lack of uh, emotional literacy. 0345 6060 is the number you need. I don't know why. I wasn't being funny or anything when I pretended not to know who the presenter was who took the call about getting kicked in, in, in the head by a horse. It was Nigel Farage. I decided there was no... Everyone's a conspiracy theorist these days. I wasn't. I just thought it would be funny to pretend not to know. But goodness me, so many people have got in touch. They said, why won't you say who it was? Well, have you been ordered not to say who it was? No, it was Nigel Farage. It was very, very funny, particularly because the more pompous you are, the funnier it is when your pomposity is pricked by a prankster. Try saying that when you haven't put your teeth in. James O'Brien on LBC. It's uh, one of those things that you haven't really worked out yourself before, but it's... It, I mean, obvious when you think about it. Of course, socio-emotional skills are going to have an impact upon reading, or, or, on, on achieving good good grades. It's why, as Mohammed points out in a text, it's why we do those books with our children. You, you know, the, the, the Ladybird books or whatever the modern equivalent is today. It's not just teaching them to read. It's teaching them how human beings behave towards each other, isn't it? And in some ways, teaching them kindness. It's why the narratives often have a moral to them and the idea that if you haven't picked up those lessons then when you get to school you are going to suffer in a variety of ways is one of those things that becomes more obvious the more you think about it um two stories that i don't think are receiving the coverage that they should be receiving and uh, oddly we turn to the guardian newspaper for, for coverage of both this morning the first is the news from Gaza that has horrified a UN human rights chief, or indeed the hu UN human rights chief, um, involving reports of mass graves containing hundreds of bodies at two of Gaza's largest hospitals. We'll hopefully get a little more on that later in the program. But somewhat closer to home, so Suella Braverman often makes much of her legal qualifications uh, when claiming to have an understanding of legislation or the relationship between the legislature and the judiciary. All the more surprising then that a um, high court decision has described uh, three of her decisions um, or, or one decision about three recommendations as unlawful. If I tell you that Amelia Gentleman is on the line to talk to us about it, you could possibly guess that it is going to involve the Windrush scandal or as her book was called, the Windrush betrayal. It just doesn't go away, Amelia Gentleman, does it? The, the, the sense that there is not just an absence of um, care for the victims of the Windrush betrayal, but, but also an absence of appetite to redress properly. What's this latest development? Yeah, uh, you're absolutely right. It doesn't go away. It's um, almost exactly six years this month um, since... Amber Rudd, the former Home Secretary, uh, resigned over the Windrush scandal um, since Theresa May apologised and promised to redress the wrongs um, done to thousands of people who uh, were living in the UK entirely legally but who were 
wrongly classified as illegal immigrants by the Home Office. Um, the High Court is hearing um, today and, and yesterday a case arguing that Suella Braverman was acting um, unlawfully when she dropped three commitments to reform the Home Office in the wake of the scandal. So we haven't had a judgment yet. Um, it hasn't been ruled yet uh, that, that her decision was unlawful, but that's the case that's being made by lawyers for one man who was really, really badly affected by the scandal. Um, and also lawyers acting for Unison and the Black Equity Organization, which is supporting this claim. Mm. But it, it's true that there was kind of two scandals almost. There was what happened to, to thousands of people who were either arrested or detained or wrongly deported or who, who lost their jobs as a result of being classified as illegal immigrants. But then the second scandal which has unfolded slowly over the last um, six years has been this um, this kind of mismatch between the very very clear promises um, for redress and to do right by those affected and and the sort of um, failure to to meet those promises and I think we've talked before about the difficulties with the compensation scheme but this is looking specifically at 30 pledges to completely reform the Home Office that um, Priti Patel, when she was Home Secretary, accepted. Yes. And then that um, Suella Braverman, when she was Home Secretary, decided um, to step away from in part. And that the High Court action is looking at three pledges that Suella Braverman decided to abandon. Did, did she ever account for her decision, Amelia? No, and actually, um, I think that that's likely to um, go be gone into in some detail in today's hearing at the High Court. Um, the lawyer acting for the Home Office yesterday said that um, the government is wasn't legally obliged to um, implement these these promises, mm. and that you can kind of evolve in your decisions about policy making. But the but the um, lawyers acting for the Windrush victims point out that repeatedly Priti Patel um, and other Home Office ministers stated very, very clearly that they accepted um, that they needed to implement a comprehensive improvement plan throughout the, the Home Office. Priti Patel said on several occasions that she wanted to make the Home Office a more compassionate, a fairer institution um, that understood that immigration and the decisions made within the, the Home Office involve and affect individual human people and that attitudes needed to change and and this is this i think is why there's so much interest in this case because although um those commitments were given given repeatedly um to the windrush generation to the people who were victims of the scandal um it became obvious as the years went past and not that much was happening to the civil servants who were working on the program that there was a mismatch between what ministers were saying and what was actually happening. And one of the most fascinating bits of the case yesterday mm. was, um, sorry about the beeping on the line, I can't was, hear it. was where it was when um, one of the um, lawyers pointed out that a civil servant had said that they needed to clarify actually what the department was doing, otherwise they would be in breach of their code of um, honesty. Why, of, of, of the three recommendations, which I'll, I'll just briefly describe, one to um, uh, commit to a program of reconciliation events so that the victims of the Windrush betrayal could be reassured by senior Home Office staff and ministers that their plight was being taken seriously and that the measures to, 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 to restore some semblance of justice were underway and so that the staff and ministers could properly understand the impact that the... Uh, uh, the scandal had had on the lives of the of, of, of the victims, and then there was the um, uh, re removal of the decision or the or the abandonment of the decision to appoint a special commissioner who'd be responsible for identifying the sorts of concerns that could lead to this kind of scandal and act as an advocate for the victims of it. And then there is the um, again the, the decision to change the remit 
She declined to change the remit of the independent chief inspector of, uh, of borders and immigration with, with a view to giving that role more, more, more power. Why would someone like Trevor Donald, who's, who's at the centre of this case and whose experiences are emblematic, really, of the whole Windrush scandal? He, he was here, as you say, quite legally. Um, he'd left Jamaica 43 years before he, he returned back to Jamaica um, when his mother was critically ill. Um, uh, his mother, I think, no, he couldn't get a passport. He went back to the island for her funeral using emergency travel documents, but then couldn't get back into Britain. And as a consequence, he lost his council flat. His relationships with his children were damaged. His entire life was thrown into disarray. Why, why does, why do Suella Braverman's decisions on these three issues harm him so? What, what, what is it that, that, uh, 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 yeah. exacerbates so, so, his suffering yeah. specifically. So Trevor Donald was um, stuck out of Britain for nine years Sheesh. as a result of this scandal. He, he went, as you said, he tried to get back for his mum to say goodbye to her before she died, wasn't able to because he couldn't get the documents. In the end, he went on emergency documents to her funeral. And when he came back to the airport, hoping to return to his home, his job, his children in Britain, he was told... He didn't have the right paperwork and he was stuck for nine years in, in Jamaica. I mean, it's it's kind of so, so, so insane. It mm. kind of you can't quite believe that that happened to him. Um, but he is standing really as the figurehead of um, people affected by the Windrush scandal because he wants to flag up that by dropping these um, recommendations, it's a signal to the people affected by um, the scandal that the government isn't listening, that its promises to um, redress all of the problems that caused the scandals um, have been broken. And it, it's um, to flag up, crucially, that this is discriminatory and therefore unlawful. I, I've, I've seen some... Not just today, but when the Mr. Bates versus the post office drama captured the imagination of the nation shortly after Christmas, I, I, I saw quite a few people, I can't remember whether you were one of them, suggesting that the Windrush scandal was um, a, a, a comparable or, 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 or even a worse event and that it, it needed also this magical alchemy of, of, of drama going to places that journalism can't reach. And, and I saw Satnam Sangura this morning um, uh, suggesting that Britain should be as angry a, a, a about this as, as it is about the post office scandal. Um, I, I'm just interested if you agree with that, if you find any sense in those observations. Yeah, I mean, I think it's difficult to do a kind of hierarchy yes. of disaster. But, but, what but there is a lot of, there's a lot the of people, uh, yeah, common ground, the isn't there, in, in, in terms of... Yes, by, um, by the Windrush scandal was horrific. And I suppose the comparison is that they were people who really struggled mm. to get their voices heard when officials were doing very bad, very bad things to them. So the state organisations that you really would expect to be supportive um, were acting in a very malign way towards them. So I think that is the comparison. There's been an amazing um, one and a half hour drama, of course, which yes. people can still see on BBC iPlayer called Sitting in Limbo, and it's really worth watching. But um, yeah, I absolutely think there should be a 10 part Netflix series. Um, I mean, the, 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 the state and the, the severity of what happened to people very recently in Britain is um, extremely hard to believe. And yeah, I think it's, I think it's important to keep on raising how this isn't a um, crisis that has been resolved. I think the government likes to say this bad thing happened. Mm. We dealt with it. We've sort it sorted it out compensation has been paid it's simply not true lots of people are still waiting for compensation over 50 people have died um, in the period between applying for compensation and receiving it so yeah it's um it's important to remember it's ongoing active and institutional punishment of completely innocent people and and, and just to clarify for anyone who, who hasn't followed your extraordinary work in this field Using Trevor Donald as a case study, it, this is someone who had as much right to live in Britain as you do, or I do, or anybody listening to this program does. And he went to a foreign country and then couldn't get home for nine years. And he wasn't alone. I mean, I've, I've spoken to many people who... Nine years? <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, it's just beyond heartbreaking. It really is. Um, 
helps. We should watch the case with interest. And, and thank you for, 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 for correcting my error at the beginning there. Schoolboy error, indeed. Reading Braverman dropping Windrush measures was unlawful. Court told, as, as opposed to court has found. We shall await the, the, the verdict, of course, with great interest. A media gentleman, reporter at The Guardian and author of The Windrush Betrayal, exposing the hostile environment. Thank you. It's 11.01. James O'Brien on LBC. Five minutes after 11 is the time. We're, we're going to have a tricky conversation now. It is prompted in part by the continuing uh, absorption of, of yesterday's tragedy when five people were killed trying to cross the English Channel in a small boat. Uh, the, the phrase crushed to death, forgive me for introducing that to you today if you weren't already aware of it, the phrase crushed to death began to appear in the coverage a little later yesterday and, and the circumstances in which people abandoned the the, the, the boat before the French authorities. Um, I, it's hard to know what verb to use. Nick had an interesting phone in this morning about what they could have done differently. I think built upon the uh, uh, idea that there's not an awful lot you can do in those circumstances, but the French authorities allowed the boat to, to continue its crossing um, uh, uh, after these deaths had occurred and after about half of the original passengers aboard, if that's the right word to use, had, 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 had quit the vessel, um, the, the remaining ones refusing to voluntarily return to French uh, land, re re refusing to return to land. So, so the question that I think doesn't get talked about enough, I think it's been hijacked. So a little reminder yesterday, I don't know how much footage you saw of the of the violence on the streets of London, uh, including an attack upon a police horse. I mean, nothing shows your dedication to um, patriotic values and wrapping yourself in a Millwall flag and attacking a police horse on a, on a, on a, on a Tuesday afternoon in London on St. George's Day. But a little reminder yesterday of, of the um, hijacking and co-opting of the flag of St. George by the far right in the, in the 1970s and beyond. I, I think that pendulum has swung back now i think that's been reversed it was nice to see rishi sunak handing out cupcakes with uh with with the red cross on them on his prime ministerial aircraft yesterday i haven't forgotten about the helicopters by the way i'm just building up a little bit more tension on that story uh, four headlines i will read you um and i'd invite you although i've kind of given away the answer to guess what the subjects of all four headlines have in common <laughs> The uh, and I uh, got Keir Starmer as well using it. Keir Starmer as well using the um, uh, the, the flag of Saint George to whip up a little bit of patriotic fervour for for good or for ill. I quite like that behaviour. I don't like the way that taking it's it's philosophically quite difficult to be proud of your country without believing that it's better than other countries. Philosophically difficult. I don't think it's emotionally difficult. If I'd been born in France, I'd be proud of France. But I wasn't. I was born in England, so I'm proud of England. Uh, and I was born of Irish stock and adopted by uh, an, a, 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 an Irish man. So I am uh, proud of Irish heritage as well. I take more pride. So I think it is the almost... Um, what would you call it? It's the genealogical equivalent of hearing your hometown on the radio and paying more attention to the story because it involves your hometown than you would do if it involved a town you'd never been to. So you hear uh, Kidderminster, for example, on the radio, and your ears prick up if you are from Kidderminster or if you have a connection with Kidderminster. I, I just understand English literature better than I understand German literature. I don't know that I could make a strong case for arguing that Charles Dickens was a better author than Fyodor Dostoevsky. I don't know who is qualified to argue that Charles Dickens was a better author than Dostoevsky or indeed vice versa. But if, if, it, if, it, if it kicked off... If Dickens raised his standard on Hampstead Heath and Dostoevsky raised his somewhere else, I'd probably muster for Charles Dickens. I'd go into battle for Charles Dickens. It's the same with Shakespeare and Chekhov or Shakespeare and Ibsen or Shakespeare and, um, I don't know, so, so, come on, think of a, think of a, I'm trying to think of a French drama, Molière, Shakespeare and Molière, whoever it may be. I, it's just a, it's an impulse. Um, an impulse. The and I did actually see someone wrapped in a Millwall flag in the in the in the throng yesterday. Although I, I don't think they were the person responsible for um, hitting a for attacking a police horse to celebrate St George's Day. What did you do today, Dad? What did you do today, Dad, to show your support for the values of these islands and your fondness for the Palestinian 
uh, uh, at night St. George. I attacked a police horse with an umbrella sign. Oh, I love you, Dad. You're the best. So just a mad state of affairs, really. But nice to have it. Um, nice to at least have the flag sort of reclaimed from those sort of clowns and weirdos. But I mention all of that because the question that underpins a lot of conversations that we have about immigration is is why here you you, you read about the small boats the dangers being faced that frankly ludicrous idea that being deported to rwanda will somehow be a more effective deterrent than than the risk of death i, I do find that quite hard to get past in a way, I hope it works because I want people to stop risking their lives trying to get across the channel. I, I'm, I'm going to remind you of one of the reasons why they have to risk their lives these days to get across the channel shortly or, or why the problem has increased exponentially in, in the last 14 years, or particularly in the last eight years, of course. But the, but, but the why of it. So um, Daniel Boffey reports this morning from, from the area where those people um, set out from uh, and he reports on 50 Vietnamese teenagers who were waiting for a bus to take them back to a forest outside Dunkirk where they have been staying at night with about a 1,000 other people. that They were hoping to get onto a dinghy, to get onto a beach, and to get onto a dinghy from, from Wimera, which is a quiet coastal town about 20 miles south of Calais. Um, and that mission had been aborted at the last minute by their handlers, who I think would be people traffickers, gangsters, mafiosi, um, really deeply unpleasant, dangerous, and violent people making king's ransoms from exploitat exploiting these desperate human beings. And and that was it. That, 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 that was really the, the question that occurred to me. We probably shouldn't allow to be hijacked by the kind of people who hijacked the flag of St. George, the, the question of why do they want to come? Because you hear it answered by unpleasant people. You hear it answered by the uh, spectre of Sch Schrodinger's immigrant, don't you? The one who is simultaneously trying to steal your job and claim your benefits and send all the money back home and and um, price you out of the housing ladder. The, the Schrodinger's immigrant, which doesn't apply specifically to asylum seekers or to people crossing the channel, but it's often an answer to the question. I took, I got a message yesterday from a bloke in Norwich who said they want to come here because it's it's one of the best places to get involved in organised crime. They know that the um, opportunities for criminality. We're talking about um, a seven-year-old girl who drowned after being thrown from an overcrowded boat shortly after leaving the French shore at five o'clock in the morning. And someone called Mark in a town called Norwich gets in touch with a radio program on LBC to suggest that the reason they were coming here was to avail themselves of the opportunities that a lax police force um, provides for criminals. I, I, I can't remember if that was before or after we'd taken a call from somebody who uh, uh, you'd be proud to, to call a friend or the, uh, uh, the quasi-adoptive mother of a young man who, who has clearly already proven to be a wonderful augmentation to the society in which he finds himself. 13 minutes after 11 is the time. Um, so that question of why is one that I'd like to address from a less uh, binary position. There's a great headline here. England is hope. That's why people risk everything to reach the UK. It's mad in a way that we spend our time surveying the damage that's been done to these islands by 14 years of Tory rule, by the idiocy of Brexit, by um, uh, the, the promotion of supremely incompetent and unpleasant individuals, whether it's Jacob Rees-Mogg and Suella Braverman or, or, or Grant Shapps and Honest Bob Jenrick, the damage that has been wreaked upon our country by the combination of intellectual and moral corruption and the subsequent promotion of epic incompetence. Oh, well, reminds me, the paperback of How They Broke Britain, which details all of this in forensic detail, is out tomorrow. Um, I, I'm very proud of that book, very proud of its success, but I will be um, delighted to see the paperback do as well as the hardback. So I do hope if you haven't read it, you will get stuck into it, although it's not pretty reading because it describes a country that has been brought to its knees by a combination of incompetence and awfulness. Lee Anderson can become deputy chairman of the party of Winston Churchill in this country, in this ecosystem. So we spend our time mourning the loss of values, mourning the loss 
of economic strength, mourning the loss of freedoms, mourning the loss of integrity, professionalism, accountability in public life, remembering the days when a minister court doing something wrong would resign. And they're not that long ago. Amber Rudd is an example of, of, of a minister resigning because of mistakes made in her department on her watch that she wasn't ultimately responsible for. You can be optimistic that things can be restored almost as quickly as they were destroyed. But think of, off the top of your head, any example of how bad things have become, whether it's anything almost that Boris Johnson did, and he, of course, continues to enjoy the support of huge swathes of the right-wing media, or whether it is that attempt led by him and Jacob Bruce mogg to rip up the rule book when one of their mates, Owen Patterson, was caught breaking the rules. So corruption is, is the only word you can use to describe that approach to rules, to, 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 to moral codes, to decency, to ethics. And yet we remain a country that many of us who live here are very proud of. I don't buy into that. I used to be proud of this country, but I stopped being proud when the Rwanda bill passed. I'm not going to let the people who passed the Rwanda bill rob me of my pride in my nationality. But we do spend an awful lot of time detailing the decline, detailing the demise, while ignoring the fact that it is still a destination of choice, a destination so attractive to desperate people that they will risk their lives to come here. And there is a logic to the question of why you don't stop in one of the places on the way. There's a logic in it. Again, it's something that's been hijacked by nastiness. It's been hijacked by lies and nastiness. The lie is that you are required to stop in whatever safe country you reach first. Just think for a minute about what that would mean for Ukrainian refugees, for example. They'd all have to have stayed in Poland. Um, and what would that have done to Poland? Have a look at how many refugees, for example, um, uh, uh, I think it's Saudi Arabia holds, the countries nearest to the exoduses in the Middle East, uh, uh, provide some form of shelter and support to refugees on a scale that European countries can't even imagine. But Germany took in a million Syrians during that war. We don't do more than our fair share. We have a government determined to do less but that question is still pertinent. You know, we can't allow these conversations to be hijacked by the far right, or indeed by people who pretend not to know what far right means. We can't, which means sometimes you've got to have them yourself. And if you're having the conversation yourself, you've got to introduce the uncomfortable element of it, which is the belief that if you were sitting in a tent in Calais, you, you think you would try to make a life for yourself in France rather than get in a dinghy and risk your life to get to England. So that, that is the question. Why does it happen? Knowing the risks of death, why does England remain... And, and you can't even say a more attractive destination because there are thousands of people who have settled in other European countries. That's why I mentioned Germany and the, and the Syrian example, which um, the usual suspects predicted at the time would, would see Germany descend into civil war. Still waiting for that to happen. The, the, but but that, that, there is that question. England has made itself, the politicians have tried to make England so unattractive and so dangerous that there is a logic perhaps in wondering why people persist in wanting to come here rather than all of the other places that they could apply for asylum. And that's what I think we should try to answer. So if you did come here, perhaps as an asylum seeker, perhaps via unsafe and uh, irregular routes, why? 03456060973. I, I kind of need help with this. So I can speculate, I can recall, I can relate things I've already heard, but really the people that I need to hear from today are people that, that, that wanted to come here above all other countries. And the reasons might be quite prosaic. It might be that your, your, your uncle was here, your only surviving family members were here. The language could be... But, but the, the challenge of understanding why is a challenge that we shouldn't balk from. It's coming up to 20 past 11. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. So uh, uh, England is hope. 
is what Daniel Boffy on this beach in Calais was told by a young Vietnamese teenager desperate to make the journey. Um, and, and of course, there's also an, an, an example of a, of a young woman who he asked whether she knew that the British government had just passed a law about being liable to be deported to Rwanda on arrival in the UK. She said, can you tell me more about Rwanda? And the journalist responds, nothing that could be said trumped her hope of getting here. Um, we are illegal here. We don't have any papers, the girl said. But would she have papers in Britain? I can't say. I can't say. She added, as one of the four Middle Eastern men standing close by loomed into view. So are these poor kids getting into these boats under false pretenses? That's an answer to the question that I'm asking. But there will be many, many answers. There may be as many answers as there are people who've made the journey. So, so why is England hope for these asylum seekers when so many have settled so successfully elsewhere? I don't want to be the country that pulls up the drawbridge. I don't want to be the country that says everyone else can deal with this international problem, even though we've contributed to causing many of these problems in places like Afghanistan and Syria. But I don't want to be that country, but we're trying to be that country. So why isn't that working? Why do so many people still want to come here? 0345 is the number you need. And I do, I, that's a long introduction, which may not have been an optimal use of time, but I do really need your help with this because I, I don't know the answers. It's 11.21. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 23 minutes after 11 and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC, where the question of why... People still seek asylum in a country whose government has been dedicated now for several years to proving that we don't want them. To the shame of many of us that live here, but no one can argue with me, the government has dedicated itself to telling asylum seekers that we do not want you to come here. Not only are they risking their lives to do so, but they are not heeding the poisonous messages from the likes of, well, I used to say Nigel Farage, and now I have to say um, Rishi Sunak, and everyone in the in the conserv in successive conservative governments have passed legislation to make it impossible to come here safely and legally for huge numbers of of people who who still want to come here unsafely and illegally. Why? Sean's in Halstead. Sean, what can you tell us? Hi, yes, Hello. I'm part of a voluntary group who work at Finching at Weatherfield Base, um, helping asylum seekers to uh, learn English, okay. conversational English. And we've been doing it for several months now. And so I can tell you something about why people come, although we don't directly ask them at any point. No. Um, but what we hear is that almost every single person is from a war-torn country or one with terrible famine. And uh, they've suffered a great deal. For instance, one guy I know was, uh, a is a Syrian and he's been uh, uh, under the control of the IS uh, for a long time and his family still are. And he's moved from one country to another in the Middle East trying to settle. And uh, in fact, he was sent to Rwanda, uh, he was sent to Rwanda from Israel and then managed to get back and get over the Mediterranean afterwards. And there are lots of stories like that. They've had terrible journeys here. They've suffered a great deal. They're very worried about their families because they're mostly in, in war-torn and poverty-stricken countries with not enough food. And they feel desperate to try and help them if they can. Um, so that's the sort of things that get people here. And the reason they choose England uh, yeah. or Britain is for two main reasons. Is they either speak language or they have family here. The other thing is that they are often from, we're almost all from countries that we've controlled in the past when we had an empire. So, for instance, if you come from Sudan, your education system teaches you English and respect for Britain. And most of the people I talk to, they say this is a, a country that has good laws and is democratic and is full of kind people. Now, of course, I don't, I don't really think that's the case, but, you know, Try not to dis Do they dis still? Do, 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 you watch, I, I, do you watch them lose these hopes? Do, do, do you mean well, in the circumstances in which you encounter them, it's going to be yeah. hard to sustain some of those beliefs? They're, they're, quite, they're very frightened. Um, 
amongst other things, um, there's been a lot of racism around this area because it's small villages which right. have no, almost no coloured people in them. So there's been quite a lot of nastiness. Yes. And in some ways, I agree that Iron Weathersfield is a stupid place to put a base, but it's here now. So my main concern is to try and help these people as much as we can. And uh, none of them, as far as I know now, can actually apply for asylum. No, they can't. They not not if they've come via would. the irregular routes. That's yeah. it. I mean, so that so number's just going to get yeah. higher and higher and higher and higher. They're left in limbo. Yeah. So and is that what is that? Is it is it hope over expectation? Is it as, as, as people yeah. will be telling them on the other side of the channel that you, you will be fine and that you will Most, be able yeah. to apply? So, so the message hasn't filtered through. Most of them didn't know about the Rwanda thing before they came, oh. and they say that people still don't but they're aware of it now they're in the country and they are worried and for, and there's so many of them they're such good nice people who just want to sit in and have a decent life and contribute and a lot of them have massively good skills like yeah. for instance yesterday i was talking to a professor of economics who spent his life not only lecturing in sudan but also doing a humanitarian work and uh, he had to flee because uh, he was threatened, his life was threatened by the regime uh, while he was actually at a conference in Geneva on uh, uh, the rights of refugees, <laughs> so he couldn't go back. And uh, so there are lots of people like that who would be very capable of settling down in our society and being an, an asset because they believe in things like democracy and the rule of law, um, and they just want a quiet life. And uh, now they're going to be stuck. And on in Wethersfield, there's uh, over 500 still um, stuck on the base, cover, surrounded by barbed wire, which makes them frightened. And it also turns out to be a gun club nearby. So initially, when they come, they think, "Oh, there's shooting around here." Good lord! Uh, Why do you do it? Why do you do it, Sean? Oh, because I love it. Uh, it's a delight to be able to teach people some English. They're so keen to learn. They're such kind and polite people and so um from a selfish point of view yeah i just really enjoy it but it's on my doorstep and uh, i really think that people need some help to settle in a new country i don't want them to stay in that horrible that base the base is improving a bit and there is now there are now some things to do there but initially when they were put there conditions were not good and there's absolutely nothing for them to do to take their minds off the situation and uh, so we actually have really enjoyable fun sessions um helping teach english and about england in general uh we all have a lot of fun and well that's um, nice to hear and yeah. and it's fun in the face of adversity really because yeah, yeah. The, the country that these people think that they are heading for doesn't currently really exist except in yeah. the hearts of people like no, you i no. suppose yeah and um but we do see people getting uh, depressed and anxious because they do. now wonder what on earth is their hope for them and uh, and what is the government going to do in the end is it going to set up more of these huge camps and I don't I don't I honestly g- gave up this them? week thinking that there's any logical answer to any of those questions they're just hoping that they can do a kind of ukippy type bonfire and then benefit from the flames that, that that start burning in the hearts of people who normally end up in idiot's corner there's no plan there's no statistical or logical basis to what they've done there's no plausible likelihood of any of the things that they're promising will happen happening and of course the only way in which success in their eyes can be achieved is by making this a country to which the people you've described don't turn and you've described them with your experiences as turning to this country because it is perceived as valuing the rule of law, <laughs> valuing humanity, it being being decent and of course also being the place that is a form of mothership for, 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 for experiences in former colonies or former provinces, or all of which in a logical universe would, would solve the riddle. But of course... When it comes to xenophobia, racism, immigration, uh, 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 demonisation of immigrants, of course, um, you couldn't be in a less logical universe. Thank you, Sean. It's 11.31. Amelia Cox has your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. 33 minutes after 11. I, I, I mean, you know, sometimes truth is quite hard, it, it, difficult truths. It, you have international refugee crises and the likelihood of them becoming more 
uh, urgent is high, uh, that people fleeing climate change already, but that's only going to get worse. Uh, oddly, people most passionately opposed to refugees in this country often seem to be the people most pa- passionately committed to climate change denial, both in, in public life and in um, uh, p- p- private life. It's a strange thing to witness. But if you are going to address the problem, I think you need to do so cooperatively and internationally. You, you do so in recognition that many members of the population don't like the idea, they don't like the principle, and one way to appease them, if that's the correct word to use, would be to point out that your country is not shouldering more of this burden than other countries are. Um, We've gone down the opposite path in the United Kingdom, where we have elected to seek to become the least attractive destination for asylum seekers in... um, in Europe, or certainly in incomparative countries. Part of that is choice. Part of it might be necessity. Uh, David Cameron, a, a rare occasion where a journalist has actually asked him questions he should be asked on a fairly regular basis. Um, uh, well, someone did. Hand on heart, if this had come up when you were PM, would you have gone for this policy? Well, we would had a totally different situation because we had a situation where you could return people uh, directly to France. Now, I'd love that situation to be the case again. That's the most sensible thing. People land on a beach in Kent, you take them straight back to France, you therefore break the model of the people's budget. So budgets. shouldn't you be trying that's, to get that? Well, that's not available at the moment. It's simply not possible Because of at the Brexit? Moment. Well, because of the situation we're in, because of the attitude of others and all the rest of it. It's not available at the moment. So you've got a choice. Do nothing. That is the Keir Starmer choice. Talk about it. Talk about faster processing. Talk about this. But ultimately, do nothing. Or you take innovative action to say, if you come to Britain illegally on a small boat, you're not going to stay. So therefore, don't come. That's the choice. Worth listening to that again, because uh, the, the, the point I often make to you about the inability to fix the problems of Brexit without admitting the problems of Brexit couldn't be better embodied than in a man who caused it and now is Foreign Secretary. Hand on heart, if this had come up when you were PM, would you have gone for this policy? Well, we had a totally different situation because we had a situation where you could return people uh, directly to France. Now, I'd love that situation to be the case again. That's the most sensible thing. People land on a beach in Kent, you take them straight back to France, you therefore break the model of the people's budget. So budgets. shouldn't you be trying that's, to get that? Well, that's not available at the moment. It's simply not possible Because of at the Brexit? Moment. Well, because of the situation we're in, because of the attitude of others and all the rest of it. It's not available at the moment. So you've got a choice. Do nothing. That is the Keir Starmer choice. Talk about it. Talk about faster processing. Talk about this. But ultimately, do nothing. Or you take innovative action to say, if you come to Britain illegally on a small boat, you're not going to stay. So therefore, don't come. That's the choice. Yeah. And how else can you come here then, Dave? I'll wait. Jakey, Jackie even is in Paris. It says Paris, France here, which is helpful because you could have been in Texas. Jackie, what would you like to I say? Could have. Um, hi, yeah. Hi. I, well, I don't know if I can put it as eloquently. Hi, James. Second time caller. Well, um, as, as Sean before you, but I, I, I did also work. Um, I worked in the camps in um, in Grand Sant, which is near yes. uh, Dunkirk and Calais, um, and I worked up there for two years and worked with organisations. Um, and I just want to say, then they were not all refugees attracted to get to Britain. No, I know. So the ones that are in the camps in Grand Sant and Calais, it's the end of the road yes. for them. They're the one, th- that's the last stop before Britain, but they're the ones that wanted to come. They're the ones, like you said, and like your callers before said, when you're um, culturally, or you may have family, a lot of Iraqis, if Afghanistanis, mm. um, Afghan, sorry, um, we would see mainly those people because they had family ties in Britain. They had cultural ties. They had historical ties, language. Um, and as we know, that's their, their only way to get in was on the boats. And, 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 and that, I, so, I, I mean, this is going to be quite consensual, I suspect, is that, that the reason why you stay on that road is, is because the destination has a particular appeal for you, cultural, familial, linguistic, yeah. colonial, uh, I, I mean, it could be lots of things. So I wonder whether the elephant in the room is that they don't realise how unwelcome they will be from, from, a, no, go, from, from a governmental stroke media perspective. 
they're sold a dream, James. They they buy a package when they most of the ones we came across. Yeah. They bought a package when they leave. They bought a cat package to get them from point A to point B. Point B being Britain in this case, um, and so they are helped in inverted commas yes. along the way by these um, by the smugglers all the way um and then the last stop and i saw it and saw it and it's heartbreaking every night those people would go out from the camps and um they would have you know rendezvous somewhere with whoever and um um it would work or it wouldn't work sometimes you didn't see them the next day you knew that they'd got you know certain people that you got to know because these are people these are humans (laughs) um we got to know and love these people um and like your other caller said you know a lot of these people obviously are very intelligent they're very educated um they're but, i mean everything. if we were to be a, 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 a brutal that, that there would be a form of natural selection in play in this process i mean really really brutal in the you know the the the, yeah. the, the weak and the vulnerable wouldn't wouldn't be able to they make these journeys you're going to be possessed of of i mean it's why a family in syria or a family in afghanistan won't won't send grandma they'll send no. the 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 what people like to call working age or even uh, the really racist people call fighting age men it's there's an inevitable yeah. logic to it but of course these are the people best place to arrive somewhere new and, and start building a life and start earning money and start helping to support the, the families over. either either to bring them over or to support them better in the country where they remain Exactly. And they can only afford, usually, I mean, they pay a lot of money. They, you know, they can, they club together and then one person, the most able person will be sent on that journey. Um, and I mean, well, you can imagine, and like your other caller, you, you, you meet some incredible people. And even I worked with, um, well, Utopia, I don't know if I'm allowed to say their name, but Utopia, who, who also help. Well, we know. also help um, people that um, to uh, to help them when the ones that stay in France, because unbelievably there are actually ones that stay in France. Well, I mean, more um, I think per capita than 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 make it here. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I'm struck by the possibility that that this new policy would work. I, I mean, whether we wanted it to or not is moot. But if everybody in these camps were to be persuaded that you know, Denise has been in touch to complain about her taxes and we've got to send these people back. Denise isn't clever enough to answer the question of where we're going to send them back to if it's a war zone or, 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 or somewhere where they'd be strung up by the Taliban or fall into the cl- fall back into the clutches of ISIS. But that's, that's the, the cross that Denise has to bear. If these yeah. people could be persuaded that the UK was full of people like Denise, would they stop coming? Probably not because they would want. They've got it, it, people being with people like Denise is probably better than being, um, you know, executed by the Taliban. You know, but I mean, they could they could stay in Germany or France or or, or do you see what I mean? Many do. Well, many I know many do. do. I, I, I I'm not labouring the point, but that. I, yeah. I'm trying to work out what the what the what Rishi Sunak lies awake in bed at night dreaming of, and is it that we make this country so unwelcome and so unpleasant in the eyes of these people that they will then seek asylum? somewhere else not that they go back to danger or, or war or persecution or famine i don't think there are any more than there were before um uh, it just it's in the headlines on the boats of course <laughs> they're, they're, obviously they're, they make great headlines the boats um yes. for some reason and, but, we've, um, and we've created that phenomenon but but i'm yes. just i'm just imagining what's going on in their head and they are trying to create a, a, a mindset they're trying to spread the word into calais that that this place is even worse than your other options. Um, well, I don't, I don't know if that information gets through. I no. mean, I don't no, work nor do in I. camps nor do today, I. but um, no, but I can't know, see any um, other rationale. I can't see why else no. you'd be doing it. You have to hope that the message percolates through the camps you used to work in, and the message is we we, we, we hate you all, and we don't want any of you to come here. You and that, and those are the voters working. that Rishi yeah. Sunak is chasing. Exactly. It's electoral, isn't it? I presume it is. I, I can't see what else it is. E- even David Cameron hasn't got the intellectual honesty, never mind the moral integrity, to say that this is impossible. This is a country that is impossible to come to safely via regular routes. Um, the methods by which we could do enforced returns have been voted out by the racists, by leaving 
uh, the Dublin Convention, which we didn't use much, but we could have used more if we wanted to. And who are you trying to appeal to? I'm trying to appeal to the country who really do hate all the refugees and not want any to come here. I'm trying to appeal to those voters and those voters only. The rest of you can get lost. It's 11.43. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, Aria is in Hackney. Aria, what would you like to say? Um, morning, James. Hello. I'm, uh, I think, like, um, so I'm sorry, like, I'm a bit shocked by, like, the recent news of people, like, uh, dying or uh, trying to cross. Um, I, I think, like, w- we are failing uh, as people. Like I, and our humanity is hanging on a cliff in relation to how we talk about people that are crossing. Yes, uh, and there's so much that is assumption, and there's so much as fear that is attached to this. And for the last decade or so, the conservative government, our government, has been feeding this beast, and I, I think like. There's a lack of understanding that the people that are crossing, they have dreams and they have hopes. Um, and people go where their dreams and hopes they can build from. And most of other European countries, whether it's Italy, Holland or France, is contrastingly different, the playing field in terms of opportunities that people can access, whether it's education for their children yeah. or whether it's jobs or, and to build, so, you, if, if you're a human being and you're fleeing from war or persecution, the thing that you want to do is go to the place that you would be the safest. Um, but uh, um, it's, e- it's so easier to get asylum in some of the countries you've just mentioned now I, I, I will talk a bit about your own experiences but in the Netherlands for example if you can prove well founded reasons for, for fear of persecution in your country of origin because of your race, religion nationality or political opinion or because you belong to a certain social group you, you can obtain a residence permit which I think means you can even work so so the the offer is better in some of the other countries that you've mentioned for one and I don't like using the word offer Aria but you yeah. know what you know what I mean I hear you but do you know like the the adaptation that we have now in terms of like putting people in camps or putting them in uh, containers. Yes. We, uh, that adapting came from places like Holland and other places. Yeah. Uh, people going, like, when they land there, if you landed in Holland, for example, you would land in a refugee camp, and you may remain there for four years, five years, while your uh, application process is happening. Um, and the prospect of life there is also one where people are living in refugee camps. Right. And, and some people, in, in certain cases, some people will be living there for seven years. So imagine waiting to hear if you're accepted uh, to live there or if you're accepted while your case is open and living there with no prospect, with no job, and all you do is wake up every so day. So our, our, our government in policy, go- our government policy, is to, to to make the United Kingdom less attractive than that. And and Holland takes plenty. They're doing a good job of it. They are doing, doing a good job. job of it. Holland takes plenty yeah. of asylum. I haven't got the exact numbers in front of me, but but I, I certainly know that Germany per capita does more, for example, than we do. We're, we're nowhere near the top of the list in terms of capacity and and overall population and then percentage in terms of asylum applications i think you you came here from somalia i think aria i have yeah why why did you set your sights on britain in particular i i was i was a child like in the journey like of um the journey of coming through europe has been long and hard and it's been like many attempts to try and come here and the only reason that we came here is because we already had family here and in terms of like belonging uh, to a community there was already established Somali community here Um, so there's that and then there's also the hopes that uh, my mother had, which is for us to access education, and in terms of the type of education that you can access in other places, will be different. And um, this is the bit. The this type. is. This, 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 forgive me for interrupting you, but I'm conscious of time. This is the bit that I think 
everybody struggles fully to understand it, 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 whether you're possessed of empathy or not whether you're fully cognizant of the need for a proper asylum system or whether you're a Tory the, the bit that people struggle to understand is that calculation and that risk well, that acceptance of risk it's human yeah. it's very human because you've got to be there to feel it human. you've got to feel yeah. it you've got to be there what are you doing man what's going on in the background I apologise that's alright I was just I, curious I, I, I'm just curious <laughs> I'm just standing um, sounds like you're cleaning I the think, windows uh, no, I was putting a table away. Uh, sorry about that. Of course that. you were. Of um, course you were. Why wouldn't you be putting a table uh, away on live radio? Yeah. Oh, yeah. But it is that risk. Uh, it doesn't... To, to, to the people taking that risk, it's an obvious calculation. To the people never faced with that, it's an unthinkable one. Literally. But we lack imagination in the potential that people have. And, and there's enough evidence that in this country of the contribution of migrants and refugees who came and made something. Um, and a lot of the time when we talk about um, people crossing, we are talking, we either talk about them in relation to what they will take from us and, and it limits. Well, here's someone on my inbox as well. Chris Green has been in touch to say, oh, it's education, access to education that I am paying for. Well, of course, we as taxpayers pay for everybody's education. And if we didn't, we wouldn't have future generations of doctors, nurses. I, well, every single, I, you name I, a profession, think, it's a consequence think, of education. I think that's a narrow point of view because... It's very generous I, of I, I, I have... I've worked and I've, I'm a, I've been a taxpayer. At the moment, I'm not working, but like I, I've been a taxpayer and I've contributed to this country. And th there's a lack of respect of people. It's a, de it's a process of dehumanization. I, 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 de and, 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 and unfortunately, it gets dressed up in self-interest or it gets dressed up in, in, in economic concerns, legitimate concerns, they like to call them. And it is also the case that there is not a single country on the planet that could take every single bona fide, genuine asylum seeker on the planet. But the solution is to cooperate or, in the minds of the current iteration of the Conservative Party, to, to become the least attractive destination of all the available destinations. And, uh, you know, I suppose people like Chris Green make their contribution to that, uh, w w whether explicitly or implicitly. They, they, they help turn the country into one of the least, or ideally the least attractive destination for someone fleeing war or worse, someone fleeing persecution. This needs to be the least attractive place in the whole world for them. That's the only way we can make sure that we don't even have to do a fraction of what could be loosely described as our fair share. Most arresting headline of today, for me, not actually the England is hope risking everything to reach UK, which we've just been talking about. Most arresting headline, UN official quotes, horrified by Gaza mass graves. It's 2024. It's also 11.51. James O'Brien on LBC. It's 11.55. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Jeremy Lawrence is a spokesperson for the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, and he joins me to discuss reports of mass graves being found in Gaza um, after the withdrawal of Israeli soldiers. Uh, some of the statistics are... Jaw dropping, Jeremy. What 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 can you tell us? Yes, thanks, uh, James. Yeah, this comes uh, hot on the heels, obviously, of the destruction of the NASA and Shifa medical complexes. What we're what we're the reports that we're seeing is that mass graves ha have been discovered at both complexes, in and around the complexes. Now, as you'll recall, these complexes uh, were were destroyed, and there were not only uh, uh, there were not only patients and medical staff at the hospitals, but obviously there were thousands of uh, people who had taken refuge in and around the hospitals themselves. The reports that we're getting, and these are from official channels inside Gaza, uh, is that close to 300 people uh, bodies have been uh, found at the NASA complex and around 30 had been uh, uh, discovered around Shifa. Um, and, and I'm reading about some of them being having, having their hands bound and, and some of them being naked, all uh, it, it, where it to be conclusively confirmed would, would certainly be evidence for accusations of war crimes. And, and that's 
part of the problem, I think, Jeremy, when I say were it to be conclusively confirmed, then you use the phrase official channels, uh, the, the, the mm. refusal to allow media in particular, Western media, into Gaza uh, uh, leaves a space in which some people, whatever their motivations, whether their motivations are pure or not, some people mm. can poo-poo all reports coming out of Gaza. Some people can claim that any... Um, uh, uh, official channels that you describe are not to be trusted. Where, where, where does one derive confidence that these reports are accurate? Well, two things I, I, I would respond to that. The first is that um, our office would call for an independent, effective and transparent investigation into the deaths themselves. Yes. Um, and secondly is that uh, we, we, we need access ourselves as an office and we are seeking that access to the sites alongside uh, other UN agencies. And, and uh, in, in the absence of that, we rely upon the organisations that can get in and are, are on the ground. And exactly. Are, uh, and, and, and James, he made a good point that the media has very limited access, if, if any access, frankly, at all in Gaza. What, what's so we've got... Yes. What status do hospitals enjoy under international humanitarian law? Do they have a special protection? No, absolutely they do. Uh, as uh, hospitals, schools and other essential services sites. So, uh, And a hospital where people are being treated, where uh, women, children, anyone who is in a crisis situation, of course they're protected and they need to be protected. And that's quite clear. IHL, uh, the laws of war, are clear on that. They are, have special protection. The, I think the technical phrase is beyond warfare, isn't it? Uh, the, 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 to, to move on, sorry, to your boss's um, de deploy. Yes, Some exactly. Some of the strikes that, in the southern city of Rafa in the past few days. Uh, the, this phrase, beyond warfare, I'm seeing more and more. It, exactly, and, and the High Commissioner was quite forthright on that. Um, the, what we're seeing is in, in throughout Gaza, over 70% of those killed are women and children. Uh, what we've seen just in the past few days in Rafa itself, um, whereby one house was hit and there were 15 children and five women in that house, then there was the case, uh, I'm sure you're aware and your listeners are aware, of the, the instance where a, uh, uh, a, a mother of a three-year-old who was pregnant and her husband were killed. Now, thankfully, the little premature baby, uh, 30 weeks old, mm. was saved. But this, this is what we're talking about when we say beyond warfare. And and once again, we return to the frustration, the the, the, the difficulty of, of um, not being able to get more journalists onto the ground to, to report um, without fear or favour. Jeremy Lawrence, spokesperson for the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. Many thanks indeed for your time. The, the, the IDF, of course, said that they had killed 200 terrorists when they went into the first of those hospitals. Um, the figure reported already by uh, Gaza civil defence spokesman to CNN on the 9th of April was that 381 bodies had been recovered from the vicinity of al-Shifa, but that's before they started finding people apparently buried in the ground. Tight for time, Lewis Goodall is in the house, um, uh, co-presenter, of course, of the, <laughs> of the New a News Agents podcast, deputising for Natasha Clark, just as Angela Rayner will be deputising for Keir Starmer, and Oliver Dowden will be deputising for Rishi. But as we know, James, that supply teacher days are always the best days, yeah, as yeah, all your audience home, will know. We can have the show, we'll do the, have the class outside. <laughs> well, all under exactly, a tree. Go on, make some predictions. Well, I mean, I think what we can definitely predict is Angela Rayner is unlikely to bring up housing policy, or at least anything that it's connected to that can easily be reverted back by the Deputy Prime Minister. And I wouldn't be surprised at all, James, if as a result she tries to make it perhaps as sort of low energy as possible, okay. tries to ask about something serious. She normally does, you know, very pugnacious turn when she does these. And uh, she and Dowden usually sort of knock seven bells out of each other. But I think in this case she will do her best to try and give or not give the opportunity to Dowden to make it as punch and duty as possible because as we all know Angela Rayner is not seen very often at the moment because there are these questions whether you think they're legitimate or whether they're doesn't a smear matter, as she it, said it's politics it and is. Dowden will use it against a mercy regardless of what she says he'll be trying to shoehorn it in at some point I'm, and when he does his benches will we'll, we'll, we'll cheer the we'll, we'll cheer the I wouldn't on. be surprised if defence came up because that's a, a reasonably good way it's a bit of a difficult way, segue into her own personal what about Rwanda that she's talking at the moment and maybe, maybe Rwanda 
propaganda as well. I mean, the thing is, I mean, the government think that they've scored a win by finally getting it through Parliament. Mm. And now there's this weird 10 to 12 week period. And it is difficult for Labour. And, you know, you talk to Conservatives and they think this is one of the big, big dividing lines that they'll have for the general election. And those people who want Sunak to go early want to basically make it a Rwanda election. They basically right. want to say, we've got a big button that we can press that will stop people coming to this country. Now, whether you think that's right or wrong, and I happen but to think that it's it wrong. Now, haven't they? Well, they've pressed it, but they'll say that's the problem. If you go really long, and I still think the election will be in December, but you sure. know, the, the, the people making this argument say that if you have an election in, say, July, you can say, we've got the button, it's about to be pressed, it's about to work, Labour have no plan, and they'll dismantle it. They'll never press the button. So Rwanda is a sort of difficult one rhetorically for Labour as well at the moment moment because basically their response is well we'll have a slightly more sophisticated plan to deal with the gangs now that's probably long term the only way you do anything about it mm. but it isn't sexy it isn't interesting and it isn't new it's not headline is. friendly indeed, i suppose it's not. although the headlines haven't moved the needle on the polling one no. one iota no indeed it's very interesting on the polling on rwanda mm. the public have actually gone from being very much in favor of it to now not being in favor of it. and you wonder with the conservatives whether they've just got to that point that they got to in the mid 90s or in, and after the 90s as well when william hay was in, in opposition when the party were doing polling and they just told people what the policy was and people said oh that sounds a good idea and then mm. they told them it was a conservative policy and then people instantly disliked it that the brand has become so tarnished and so difficult and so damaged that the public just stopped listening and even actually when they intrinsically like an idea that they hear if it, they realize it's providence they come to dislike it um laura disagrees she says, on the contrary, I think Angela Rayner will come out fighting. Well, she may well. She I'm going to well. go with Laura on well, this. Laura let's may make, well let's be introduce right. let's a little bit of jeopardy. Let's make this interesting. I think she'll come out <laughs> punting. I'm not sure she speaks any other language, Lewis. No, that's true. And she has I been... don't mean that as a criticism. No, no, no. And she's she is that sort of uh, politician. And like you say, in one sense, James, no matter what the subject is, there is no way that Oliver Darren will get, get through his right, six yeah. responses without finding a way to bring it up. And of course, Labour know that. So they will have a repost ready. So it's not as if there will be no energy to it at all. My instinct, though, is that Rainer might want to just try and, for once, keep her head down a little bit. It's just my, not a weekly uh, adventure into clairvoyance. So I'm not going to make a habit of it. But it, it, if, Why not? I mean, she could go in with William Ragg and Mark Menzies. She could. And then, and then, the, co- then the pushback on her alleged transgressions would probably... Uh, Apart from Tory MPs pretending that it's a zinger, it would sound a little bit ridiculous in the in the scale of of, of egregiousness. It would, although it's an easy way for him to come back in terms of personal probity, right? So, um, but look, I mean, this is um, the 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 there is, as we say, there is no way that it's not coming up one way um, or the other, and it is a uh, it is probably it is at the moment Labour's because they don't think it's landing. I was talking to some no. Labour people last night; they were saying it's when it has come up on the doorstep in certain constituencies they've been in, including the Blackpool by election. I was talking to someone who'd been there recently; they said it had come up a few times on the doorstep and each time they actually said rain is being it's been extremely unfair to the class angle of it has landed yeah. more than so perceived. so so it's not as if i don't think they fear it but obviously in political terms it is a running sore make sure we don't cross early keith because jonathan gullis is talking <laughs> all right but we do need to remind you of course that we will cross live to the house of commons when sir keir starmer gets to his feet um I, I, I one thing we've missed is the sick note stuff she could go in on that of course that's quite interesting public yeah. and again I, I it could be for the reasons you describe everything they touch turns to whatever the opposite of gold is in the in the sort of anti-midas but the, the but the sick note stuff perceived really as a targeting of vulnerable people yeah although again i think down the street felt that that had been a good day for them it's and that been horrible been to refugees they... we've been horrible to poorly people why don't people like us more <laughs> <laughs> it's remarkable. Isn't it? <laughs> it's a plain, came the plaintive cry from yeah. from Downing Street. I mean, well, again, who do we have to be horrible to to make them like us more? What? The free childcare probably too early to start picking over the success or otherwise of that scheme. Yes, although again, it's something that Labour think they have something to say about for the general election, it's and actually unfolding. will be one of the few policy uh, fissures that, that will exist in a general election where actually policy, I suspect, won't come up very much at all. You say Jonathan Gullis is he's really going for it. Yeah, I actually, we're not, I can't even hear it, but I don't need to hear. It. I feel like I can hear it from a mile away or so in Westminster. Um, yes, never, the MP ne- for Stoke on ne- Trent. Never knowingly course. subdued. Um, <laughs> six minutes after 12 is the time. Uh, part of the reason why we're crossing late, I presume, is because of the intervention from the uh, MP for, 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 for Stoke. Um, I, that pretty much covers it, doesn't it? We'll have to, we'll have to wait and see. I, I think I, I've is got the good... public on my side, Lewis Goodall. The, the, okay. They feel that Angela, the idea of Angela Rayner adopting a muted and uh, uh, and and almost apologetic approach is 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 low. Is, well, who knows? I mean, defence. I mean, defence is is good territory as well because this this thing they came up with yesterday, saying they're going to increase defence spending by seventy five billion, which is 
on the, predicated on the most one of the most bogus ways of accounting that you can you can think it's basically. Oh, I've seen that of, today. As Jonathan well, Portes has put together well, some number crunching. Oh, a, hang on, hold your horses. Fine, here here he is. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I first of all share with the Deputy Prime Minister's comments regarding our Jewish community and a happy Passover, and also start by acknowledging the loss of David Markand and Baroness Massey, both of whom played historic, made historic contributions in this parliament, politics and wider life. And also send my condolences following today's news to the family of Lord Frank Field, who is a good friend of mine and a colleague, and who was a tireless campaigner against poverty and a champion for his constituents. Yeah. Mr Sp Speaker, I know the party opposite is desperate to talk about my living arrangements, <laughs> but, but the, public, the, public, the public want to know what this government is going to do about theirs. Yes. Natalie from Brighton has been served with two no-fault eviction notices in 18 months. She joins nearly a million families at risk of homelessness due to his party's failure to ban this cruel practice. Now, instead of obsessing over my house, when will he get a grip and show the same obsession with ending no-fault evictions? Well, to begin with, it is a pleasure to have another exchange with the Right Honourable Lady in this House our fifth in 12 months. Any more of these, and she'll be claiming it as her principal residence. <laughs> on, on, the issue, on the issue of no-fault evictions, it may have escaped the right on the lady's attention, but we will be voting on exactly that matter later today. The Conservative government taking action. Mr Speaker, he clearly thought he could work, spend all week obsessing over my living arrangements. I didn't even bother to read up on his own government's bill this afternoon. The reality is he caved in to vested interests on his backbenchers and delayed justice for people like Natalie. Yes. This week, the Housing Minister said there is no solid date for banning no-fault evictions. The Housing Secretary now says it won't happen before an election. So if he can give us a date, can he name it now? I can name the date for the Right Honourable Lady. Today, it's today that this House will be voting on it, and I'm confident that in line with our manifesto, we will deliver on that commitment. Angela Rayner. Mr Speaker, he clearly hasn't been looking up on his own government bills. But let me turn to another Tory housing failure. Leaseholds are a rip-off and a con. But the government's proposed ban on new leaseholds applies only to houses. The majority of leaseholds are in flats. What's the point on a ban on new leaseholds if it won't apply to flats? Again, the right honourable lady is talking about legislation introduced by this government, which the party opposite totally failed to introduce in their entire time in office. And it's no surprise, because it's this government which has brought house, social housing waiting lists down by nearly half a million and delivered more affordable homes in the last year and last 12 years than Labour delivered when they were in office. But of course, all, all of this can only be paid for by making sure that we have a strong economy. And, and I'll tell you, her, her, policy, her policy to repeal every single Conservative trade union law in the first 100 days would open the door to French-style wildcat strikes, sweeping away the reforms that made this country great. And we all know, though, Mr Speaker, the one reform that the Right Honourable Lady would not abolish from Margaret Thatcher, the right to buy your council house. Angela Rayner. Mr Speaker, I was expecting a little bit better from him today. He seems to be a bit worn out. Maybe it's the 3am calls from the bad men that have been keeping him up at night. But he also, <laughs> Mr Speaker, he also talks about strikes and the unions. We've had more strikes under this government's watch than any time before. And once again, he hasn't read his own bill. 
their ban on leasehold won't apply to the majority of people. It's like banning non-doms but exempting Tory Prime Ministers. <laughs> and he speaks about affordable homes. Families are trapped in temporary accommodation and stuck on waiting lists. And in the West Midlands, his mayor has used his multi-million pound housing budget to build just 46 social homes in eight years. That's almost as many as the Chancellor's property portfolio. But the British people know that his party won't build the homes that this country needs. So when are they going to get a chance to vote for a government that will? Well, I'm surprised the right on a lady raises the West Midlands when, when Labour controlled Birmingham have virtually bankrupted the council, a hiking up council tax by 21%, whilst in the meantime, and I'm sure this would please her, continuing to hand out 1.8 million to the trade unions. By contrast, Andy Street, our brilliant mayor of the wider West Midlands, has delivered 6.1 billion of investment to improve transport. So there you have it, the contrast between the Conservative Party and the Labour Party, the usual political opportunism from her, failing to ask about the issues that really matter. If you want more bins, if you want more bin collections, more potholes filled, lower debt and lower council tax, vote Conservative, because whether it's Ben Houchen in the Tees Valley or whether it's Andy Street in the West Midlands, it's only the Conservative mayors who deliver more for less. Well, Mr Speaker, that's pretty revealing that he thinks that housing isn't an issue for the British people, because I think it really is. And people in glass houses shouldn't throw the stones, because in Birmingham, and across the whole of this country, councils are facing black holes because of his government's yeah. austerity yeah. programme. And he's all, I would also warn the Deputy Prime Minister that Tory councils have also faced 114 notices, and Birmingham Council has had over a billion pounds taken from their budget from some of the poorest people. More than 16,000 families face losing their, inc uh, their homes after the party's mini budget, Mr. Speaker, and mortgage bills continue to soar. Yeah. Meanwhile, the former Prime Minister parades around the world in a twisted victory lap promoting a new book, <laughs> saying that the mini budget was her proudest moment. So since she won't apologise to those families All losing their it. home, will he? Yeah. Well, what the Prime Minister has done since he has taken office with the Chancellor is to restore stability to our economy. Inflation halved and more down to 3%. And as a result of that, in an increasingly dangerous world, the Prime Minister was able to announce his plan for the biggest strengthening of defence spending in a generation. But it should come as no surprise that the party opposite refused to say whether they back it or not. Because this comes from the Right Honourable Lady, who voted to scrap Trident and install in Downing Street someone who wanted to change the army into a Peace Corps. There you have it. Yeah. Mr Speaker, friends, we all want to see 2.5 per cent. The difference is, is that we haven't cut the army to its smallest size since Napoleon. And Mr Speaker, Never mind some de secretive deep ste uh, spe uh, state. Never mind some secretive deep state. It's the state of the Tory party that's the problem. They're in a deep state of sewerage. After 14 years, they failed renters, they failed leaseholders, and they failed mortgage holders. But, Mr. Speaker. I read with interest that the right honourable gentleman has been urging his neighbour in number 10 to call an election because he's worried they might get wiped out. Oh. Has he finally realised that when he stabbed Boris Johnson in the back to get his mate into number 10, he was ditching their biggest election winner for a pint-sized loser? <laughs> I think, that, I think the whole House will have heard, despite all the bluster from the, the, the lady opposite, 
not a single word on whether she would actually back our plans to invest in our armed forces. No plans in a dangerous world. And of course, as ever, the Deputy Leader is always looking to attack others' failures, but never the one to take responsibility for her own. She once said, you shouldn't be waiting for the police to bang on your door. If you did it, then you shouldn't be doing your job. The Right Honourable Landlady should forget her tax advice and follow her own advice. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And levelling up like my friend uh, earlier, in the Calder Valley is absolutely on fire. 196.5 million for hospital reconfiguration, 150 million for flood defences, no fewer than 11 schools being remodelled or rebuilt as we speak. Um, 45 million for three town centre regeneration, and Elland is getting a new railway station as well. Yeah. So, does my right honourable friend agree with me that the nays naysayers around about levelling up need look no further than the Calder Valley to see what a great achievement this government is, is, is doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Deputy Prime Minister. Well, my honourable friend is absolutely right. It's not just the Colm Valley, but it's communities up and down the country. The government is investing billions in infrastructure across the United Kingdom, creating jobs and opportunities in every region. And I know that my honourable friend has been a staunch advocate for the Calder Valley, which is a fantastic example of that in action. Yeah. It's leader of the SNP, Murray Black. Yeah. Yeah. May I join in wishing the Jewish community a happy Passover yeah, yeah. and also in sending my condolences to the families of, of family and loved ones of Frank Field. Two years ago, when mass graves were discovered in Ukraine, this House united in condemnation and rightly treated these graves as evidence of war crimes yeah, yeah, yeah. which Russia yeah, yeah. must be made to answer for. Yep. Yesterday, Palestinian officials uncovered two mass graves outside the bombed hospitals in Gaza. These graves also constitute as a war crime, don't they? Yeah. Yeah. Deputy Prime Minister. Well, of course, we would expect the, the democratic government of Israel to investigate any allegations of misconduct, and that's exactly what they do, and it's exactly what the Foreign Secretary and the Prime Minister urge them to do. But I find it quite extraordinary that she seeks to draw parallels between the legitimate war of self-defence of Israel and the conduct of Russia. Very black. 300 bodies including the elderly and the injured, some of which had been stripped naked, mutilated with their hands tied behind their backs. Mm, yeah. The UK's own arms policy states that if there is even a risk that war crimes may be taking place, then that is reason enough to halt the sale of arms. Yeah. Yeah. Given all we know, why then is the Prime Minister yet to do so? Yeah. 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 Deputy Prime Minister. Well, we continue to urge the Israeli government to investigate any allegations of misconduct. The difference, though, is that we can trust the Israeli government, a democratically elected government, to properly investigate those things. And, of course, we keep the advice under review. The Foreign Secretary has recently made it clear that he has conducted uh, a determination and has not changed his advice regarding uh, export licences, and I think that is the correct decision. Colin McCartney. Speaker, yeah, 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 yeah. the good people of Lincoln who all declare their taxes and pay tax on their profit when selling their second homes. It is 20 past 12. Um, I, I think there's good. Back. I'll tell you what, I'll go and pop some humble pie in the oven. <laughs> <laughs> I, will serve well, it, I will serve it up after this. James O'Brien on LBC. Uh, 1223, you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. I, I had to double check the time then. That, that PMQ's went on for rather a long time. Um, it's good. I, I mean, crikey, goodness knows it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough gig at the best of times predicting what is going to come up. But I think it's fair to say 
But well, I'm just your, your suggestion that she would steer violently well, clear of all mention of her of housing related issues well, was was not your finest moment. Well, I mean, I'm just midway through my humble pie, James. And, you know, you might want to try it sometime. No, uh, <laughs> so I'm allergic. <laughs> I'm yes, a... <laughs> yes. I shouldn't even bring it into this studio. It's like having it's like it's having like some nuts on a, a nuts plane. On a plane. <laughs> exactly. Uh, no, but look, I think in a way, I made the mistake of doing what a lot of. Uh, a lot of conservative MPs and conservative people in the press are doing at the moment, which is underestimating Angela Rayner, right? And underestimating the extent to which she is not a normal political figure. I think most mm. political figures in that circumstance would have done exactly as I suggested, which is try and kind of suppress it and keep it as quiet as possible and get through the session as unscathed as possible. Yes. She and her team, I think, clearly, completely correctly calculated, and it was a risk, it was a gamble, it was a gamble that Dowden would fall apart, yeah. which he did. He did actually he fall did. apart. You don't and see that very often. No, indeed. And it was a strategy. The strategic intent was to m gamble and to make a bet that if she brought it up straight away, that his entire line of attack would crumble, collapse like a pack of cards. And, it and indeed it did. He had absolutely nowhere to go. You could feel it. I mean, it was actually, even by PMQ standards and someone who doesn't do it every week, yeah. it was an extreme. He started to flail, like a really, really poor cool performance. Voice. And then you could hear it in his voice. And from there on, she had nowhere to look but forward because she just completely sort of bossed him around the House of Commons chamber, frankly. And, you know, with actually, now and again, a line which even by, actually by PMQ standards, there are about 1% of jokes in PMQs which are genuinely funny. The rest are just parliamentary funny, i.e. Mm. everyone goes, ha ha, we could see that coming from 5,000 miles ago away. But talking about um, saying that he looked exhausted, maybe it's because the bad men are calling him in the middle of the night, 3 a.m. <laughs> we genuinely laugh out loud funny, right? A reference yeah. to the Mark Menzies. Um, uh, scandal. So, look, they clearly calculated that in this case, a good, the best defence is a good offence. It was a risk because a more nimble and fleet of foot opponent might have been able to reverse it and come back and have anticipated it and have a stronger line and gave her gave them she was basically giving them the wound that they could prize open but Dowden proved himself in completely incapable of it and, and and that is I mean when you say flailing that the idea that he somehow ends up suggesting that the British people don't care about housing policy or don't care about evictions or don't care about the right to own your own home properly in the context of leaseholds it, it I mean it sounded like someone who was desperately going through pieces of paper yes. looking for something what can I say? Yeah, so yeah. you think that they would have dedicated their preparation to kebabbing Angela Rayner yes. or, or, or barbecuing over the coals of her alleged misdemeanours yes. regarding her housing arrangements 10 years ago. And, and when she said, you're about to tell a rubbish joke about my housing arrangements, it just completely he had no choice but to stand up and tell a rubbish joke about her housing. And from that moment on, it was it was... She, he was toast. The way it works is is that they will work out, if he says this and you say that, and then you sort of crowbar or segue that into that and, uh, and so on, and by bringing it up instantly, it meant that he had uh, nowhere to go. And I think what it shows is, in a way, is that, again, PMQs is not often revelatory or often doesn't remind us of anything. They just exchange kind of bromides sort of half an hour. But I think this does remind us just politically exactly why it is that so many in certainly the right-wing press and the Conservative Party itself, fear Rayner as a political figure because she is an unusual and unorthodox political figure and she has a style and she has a, a sort of mode of politics which is unusual, which is effective, which is cut through, which does cut through and which very few politicians, very well, particularly Conservative MPs, they struggle to know how to deal with it. You know, you saw it in Dowden there, bringing up about right to buy and so on, and then she says, well, yeah, I did, like lots yeah. of working class people do. And they go, it's like it's it's like the computer stops working. Yeah. It's like the little Boris Johnson used to call it the pinwheel of doom, you know? It's like the, the computer is broken down. So I think that the net result of today will be that she will have affirmed to her allies and to people in the Labour Party why she is so valuable, but she will also have reminded her opponents how important it is for them to continue the fight against her. And I think the net result of today is that those opponents will double down because they will be angry and furious that they've lost an opportunity to actually nail her down on some stuff. The way you can tell, James, that Dowden went completely off piece, not least because of just his voice and flailing mm. around, but it's because in that situation, an ideal outcome for Dowden would have been to put her on the spot about something, would mm. have been to ask a question that she refused to answer or and do the classic kind of like, it's that. not for me, you know, this isn't, it's questions for the deputy prime minister, it's not for me, all of that sort of stuff, to get a kind of non-denial denial. He didn't even get that far. So that's how you know that the whole strategy just completely collapsed. Gosh, yes. I, I, I mean, it, it's, it's hard to over... 
It is hard to exaggerate how bad that was for Oliver Dowden. Um, I, I, the bit, the only bit that perhaps, I mean, it was effective, and I suspect that the galleries will have loved it, but what did she call Rishi Sunak? Call a pint-sized loser. It's a bit sizest. It's quite Trump, it's, you know, like it's, it's, it's quite, yeah. I mean, it's very sort of of, of the age, one, right? I mean, I mean, you know, she's fielded a heck of a lot of personal criticism, very personal criticism over, over the years. I, but wasn't to, it something to see that, it at the dispatch box, you wouldn't have got that from Keir Starmer, would you? No, no, I don't think so. <laughs> wasn't, um, wasn't it a Nadine line, I think, pint size Oh, was it? I think so. It oh, suddenly rings a bell. Interesting. Maybe she's read Nadine's book. Um, I, I got to mention Dell, who's been in touch because I had already spotted this, and oh, I don't. Yeah. And I don't know whether you, you're much younger than me, so you probably. I don't know whether it fits into your popular culture orbit, but mm. it, it it reminded me of the final rap battle in Eight Mile. The uh, right, the, you, you've lost me. Now. I've lost you already. Unfortunately, yeah. When a Rabbit, played by Eminem, uh, non pluses his rival rappers, the leaders of the free world, uh, by essentially what list- are you talking about, James? You're right. By, <laughs> by listing all of the things that he knows they're about to accuse ah, him of. Okay, fine. In what is known as a diss, you see, ah. Lewis, and and he <laughs> in it, and he destroys them. He he absolutely destroys right. them because all of the things they had prepared to say, right, Rabbit says himself right. and leaves them floundering, flustered, failing. But Dell has pointed this out to me by texting Angela eight mild him. So didn't and there's quite about a dozen people have had the same thought. Justin says Angela Rayner did an eight mile, but Dell feels the need to add in brackets. Obviously getting me mixed up with you. It's an Eminem movie where he raps his criticisms in the final rap battle. That's nice. Close brackets. Right? <laughs> Thanks, I love Bill. it. I love it when our LBC listeners send you explanatory notes. <laughs> it's very important. And it's really helpful it's to, be to be encouraged. Honest. It is to, to be, be encouraged. encouraged. Absolutely. Um, and, and I think you've said this, but just if, in case you haven't, to be absolutely clear, this is why they hate and fear her so much. Indeed so. Indeed so. And that is, and as I say, the net result of today will be that those people, angry that Dowden could not score what and should have been basically an open goal, will redouble their efforts. So expect to see more in the Sunday papers, I would say. 12.31 is the time. Last word to Michael, who says, if anybody has seen the 8 Mile Eminem uh, movie, the classic last battle where he brings everything that he knows they will say about him um, and gets there first. It's 12.31. Tim Humphrey has your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. 34 is the time. I, I, this is one of the best things anyone's ever sent me. I just think this is so clever and so off the cuff and so on the money. Off the cuff and on the money. Be a good album title. Um, but I just read out that message from Dell, who was explaining to me unnecessarily what 8 Mile is and why Angela Rayner's performance at the Dispatch Box reminded so many people listening to this programme of Eminem's character's performance in the final scenes of the film 8 Mile. But but Dell felt the need to explain it to me. Bob in Norfolk got in touch and said, is that known as stansplaining, James? Now, I'm not going to explain that because I shouldn't have to, but Bob, you are currently top of the class top of the class um you really are 12 35 is the time you may on occasion have heard me wax somewhat lyrical about the the the, the, the cultural eden that manchester was at the at the back end of the 1980s and the early 1990s by a combination of frankly unfeasible circumstances <laughs> This former public schoolboy found himself absolutely smack in the middle of the most exciting musical and cultural movement, um, I, I would say, certainly of the last 30 or 40 years, which is why I was so interested to see a new book by Sasha Lord, um, ably assisted by the journalist Luke Bainbridge, called Tales from the Dance Floor. We should probably begin with one of the finest celebrity endorsements I've ever seen on the front of a book, <laughs> Sasha, which is from Sean Ryder, saying, might help fill in a few blanks, which we both know is very optimistic on Sean well, Ryder's part. It was, and it was the first session on the book, actually. Luke previously wrote uh, Sean Ryder's book, and he, he said to me, he said, you know, this is really good, you've actually got a better memory than Sean Ryder. And <laughs> I don't know whether that was a compliment or not. <laughs> <laughs> I've got furniture with a better memory than Sean Ryder. <laughs> so who are you, Sasha Lord, in the context of your qualifications to write this book? Because people may be or will be familiar with your with your work in, in, in Manchester as a, as a sort of nighttime czar subsequently, but, but why was this the book that you were born to write? Well, you, you talk about that period that we call 
called Manchester. And um, I went to a very good school, James. I went to Manchester Grammar. But when I was in the sixth form, that coincided with the Manchester period. So Stone How Roses, old are you? 51. OK, so I, I will I, I'll run through a list of names after this and Great. see how many of our mutual friends we can identify <laughs> from precisely that period. Go it was that period, Stone Roses, Happy Mondays, New Order, Factory Records and, and the Hacienda. And when everybody at my school was going to study to become doctors or, or nurses or accountants, <laughs> lawyers, I was obsessed with the music scene. So I actually left with two U's and an E at A-level. Never. But these are exam grade results. We're yeah, not, obviously. We're not, yeah, thank yeah you. there's a gag in yeah, that. Um, never in my wildest dreams did I think 30 years later... Your parents must say. have been gutted. Sasha. They weren't happy. They weren't. Were you happy. out every night? Were you doing Thursday, Friday, Saturday? Were you? At, uh, yeah, on a regular yeah. basis. Fair enough. Um, Two years and but, e. That's, I mean, that is an extraordinary achievement in so many ways. It was. Uh, and I actually hold the record for uh, in bet, the school, the, which the, the it, lowest grades ever from Manchester grade. Grammar School. But what's interesting is uh, they ushered me out. But now they have a walk of fame in the school and they actually have my pitch next to Ben Kingsley. Oh, well done. Which is good. That is nice. But I've gone on to form. Uh, the biggest nightclub in the world, Warehouse Project, biggest metropolitan festival in the UK, Park Life Festival, also advisor to the mayor, Andy Burnham as well. And talk the, about... The, the impos- mayoral candidate. The mayoral candidate. And talk about imposter And a full syndrome. list of mayoral candidates can be found in all the usual places. <laughs> talk about imposter. Never in my wildest dreams did I think I'd have a Sunday Times bestseller. So where does the story begin? Story begins way back at school when I was failing everything and I had an art teacher called Mr McGuinness who pointed out I was dressing exactly the same as everybody else, like a penguin at school. I had one of those geeky black briefcases with the combination locks on it. And he's like, look, why? Why are you conforming to everything? And he knew I was interested in art and he said, why don't you go and look at a band that's playing at the Hacienda called The Man from Del Monte. And that's what triggered it. So I owe my life to a teacher called Mr McGuinness. He probably we would have got into trouble if he'd known, because you'd have been underage for a start and he was encouraging you to, to knock these about days, in a nightclub. These, these days, days, yes. I suppose these, yes. these were different eras. M- maybe even more so, sharing a cigarette. Uh, 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 yes. <laughs> and and what, 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 what happened? What, what was it? What was the aligning of the planets the, the the alchemy the distillation of the of the magic that that happened the f- and like that club was was a was the mothership of it tony wilson had set the tone really or set the it laid was. the foundations for this mad revolutionary moment what, what it was a moment that was if you think back to Manchester back in that period, it was a ver- and Liverpool actually, it was a very yes. grey, depressing area. The Thatcher years, we were forgotten about, and we created our own fun. We had to party to get through it, and it didn't matter in the Hacienda if you're a postman, a teacher, a student, unemployed. Everybody came together for that one reason. We called it the church. They're all under that one roof. You could say there was there was also the coincidence of the explosion of ecstasy as well that did actually, mm. you know, help help create the scene. But it was a very very magical moment. And I have to say, James, it does feel like something's happening like that in Manchester again now. Um, our nightlife is booming at the moment. Um, well, you would say that, wouldn't you? I would, obviously, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, uh, t- t- tell me a bit about. The, the, the sort of segue from hobby to livelihood. You started promoting gigs as well by some of the biggest names in music. I, I did. I started to put uh, student nights on to begin with at the Hacienda, actually, then uh, at a, a club called Home Night Club on Juicy Street and Paradise Factory, which is a gay club at the weekends. But I think what's interesting is in the 90s, when you start to read the book, I was shot at once. I was petrol bombed. Um, See, and when- I, I was there the night it shut when, when the... the the really, really scary night when they all let us out through one little entrance. and That's when it was stormed by a gang. Yeah, yes. and, and we walked up the tunnel of riot shields yes. and the dogs were on, you know, their back legs and, and it was just... That was so, quite so, a regular thing. The, the, and the, the, yes, the crossover of criminality because there was so much money to be made from the drugs. That was the problem. In those days, the gangs ran the doors, yeah. predominantly Salford gang. And, and you got caught up in that, inevitably. Got caught up in it. Um, I, I, I'm sort of asking about the, the, the bands that you promoted that everyone would have heard of. When was the moment when you thought this this is a career rather than either a, 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 a mad adventure or a glorified hobby? 
I think New Year's Eve 1997, I'd hired Granada Studios, which they opened up all the film sets. We actually caught a couple of students having a bit of nooky in Jack and Vera's back garden. Oh, right. Back yard, sorry. And we, we had to throw them, exactly, we had to throw them out. But that was the first time I'd actually made some money. I think the moment I realised, actually, we have something really special here was when Snoop Dogg walked out on stage at Part Life because that was the first time we'd booked a huge global name. Um, the, the, the nature of Clubland in Manchester, I'm interested to hear that it's resurrecting. I, I tell my children I'm probably too old to get to get my bright red feeler high tops back out of storage. <laughs> Sergio Ticini. Remember the trainer shop on the on the ramp down from Manchester Piccadilly, yes. the one on the right? I yeah. used to make places of, places of pilgrimage there. And... Um, you mentioned the, 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 the warehouse project and part life and all, all of the other projects that you've been involved with subsequently. Is there something in the water? Is it? Is it because it, it, I feel like an honorary Mancunian because I was there at this absolutely seminal time. But the, 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 is it the history? Is it the cotton trade? Is it the fact that you have that working class tradition going back to the Peterloo massacre and beyond uh, 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 com- combined a bit with a Liverpudlian disrespect for authority or refusal to be cowed, the immigrant experience? What What is in I the water it, in Manchester? I think it's, it's a combination of all those factors. And in fact, my first nightclub, Sankey Soap, was in one of those mills, yeah. one of the industrial mills. And the story goes um, that the night beforehand, the old door firm wanted it. It was previously open 94 to 98. I opened it in 2000. And the police said to me, you cannot have the old door firm on it. So I said, no, you can't. We had a substation in the car park at the back and the old door firm climbed over, put a bed mattress around the substation, poured petrol all over it, <sighs> set it alight. What they didn't realise was because we were original mill, an industrial mill, we had our own generator inside. Good Lord. So we were raving all weekend whilst the rest of Ancoats, the area was been pitch black. Everyone had been knocked out. Yes. Um, well, I mean, you've been scared. You've been beside yourself with excitement. You've made, I presume, a fair old chunk of change but there's been right. there's been feuds along the line falling yes. out with business partners it's all in here who did you have in mind when you wrote it um i actually had my mum in mind quite did a you? lot because obviously going back to the start you, of the you, interview, lost, you lost your dad at about the age you are now i think i did you? Yeah. yeah but you know she wasn't that impressed when i got two years and any e. <laughs> so to actually now put it in black and white and actually james she didn't know half the stories no uh, and so she started reading this a couple months and, and the book is dedicated to my mum and what does she make of it she was mortified. Completely mortified. Yes, well, why didn't you tell me you, that you were shot at? I was like, well, not just that's going to bring it up. Phone your mum up about <laughs> exactly. it. Exactly. Um, Tales from the Dance Floor by Sasha Lord with Luke Bainbridge is is out now. And I, I mean, I think we've sold it to anybody who was in the area at the time or even adjacent to it. Just just take a take take a minute or so if you want, um, Sasha, to to tell people who've never been to Manchester in their life why they should read this book. Um I think well clearly I'm biased, but yeah. we are the most exciting city region in the UK. Sunday Times are just named as the UK's capital of nightlife. And we no, have you a do, you've got the wrong hat on. You've not got your author hat on. You've got your night times on. Why, why, who, why would I want to read this book about it's, this it's, story, about it's this the history. history? It's the history from the 90s, from my life in the 90s, which was the Wild West up to now, where Manchester is such an exciting place where buildings are coming out of the ground. It's changing on a daily basis and things, things are really happening. But it's the story, it's a contrast between how we were then to how we are now. Yeah, I, I mean, it's like reading a book about punk if you, if you, exactly if you weren't there, isn't it? In exactly a way, it's, 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 it's cultural history, social history and urban history all, and, and a memoir yes. all exactly. rolled into one. And uh, is it an, an apology letter to your mum or just a, a kind, kind postcard? Of an apo- it's a postcard. Yes, a postcard. <laughs> a postcard to yes. your mum. Sassy Lord, thank you so much. Time now is 12.45. James O'Brien on LBC. <laughs> It is 12 minutes to one and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC where I have two bits of business to attend to. I quite like the way I'm not just on the I'm in the hinterland now between quite liking the way you've taken it upon yourself to to assist Keith in reminding me of all the things that I am likely to forget to do. And the hinterland will end when I start getting a little bit irritated by it, because even though I admit to it and remind you of it all the time. You pointing out my failings to me, I feel differently from me pointing out my failings to you in a slightly self-deprecating and occasionally even quite ironic way. So I am aware, for example, 
of the helicopters. I, I told you a story uh, uh, two hours ago uh, or, or teased a tale of helicopters, which I will now share with you in a little more detail. Simply put, I'm going to read you four headlines and ask you, what do you think the subjects, the four individual subjects of these four headlines have in common? The first is, Tory donor is boss of firm, fined £30.6 million for mis-selling insurance. The second is, biggest Tory donor said looking at Diane Abbott makes you want to hate all black women. The third is, Covid inquiry must investigate Clipper Logistics PPE deal, says York MP. And the fourth is, Tory donor who funded Sunak private jet has 14.3 million pounds worth of assets frozen in fraud case what do you think those four have in common uh, the answer is that they have all funded rishi sunak with private helicopter travel in the past year it's another excellent little bit of digging from russell scott fast becoming one of my favorite investigative journalists and whose work you can follow on twitter um not least because i'm just about to retweet that story about the helico helicopter travel and there you can find the link to his Substack as well and the second bit of business to attend to today um, I'm just stretching the parameters ever so slightly because I think this is a blog rather than a newspaper article, but it's such a great contender for Unhinged Headline of the Year that I am on this occasion prepared to include it. Unhinged Headline. It's by Patrick O'Flynn, which is a name you may be familiar with. He's the chancer that um, dragged Nigel Farage out of this radio studio after Nigel Farage managed to soil himself while being interviewed by me. But anyway, he's written an article for, I think, the Daily Telegraph blog under the headline, It's virtually illegal to be English and proud. Which means we should... I'll read that again. It's virtually illegal to be English and proud. Uh, I know that Stuart Lee often listens to this programme, comedy genius and observer columnist Stuart Lee. I, I, I wonder whether this marks the end. I, I, Stuart does new material and has a, has a new show every, every year. It doesn't really return to the old territory. But I wonder if this is actually the last post moment for his um, conversation with a cab driver in which the cab driver told him that you can't, you can't say you're English in this country anymore without getting arrested. <laughs> And that was satire 10 years ago. And now it's a Daily Telegraph comment piece by uh, Nigel Farage's former butler. These days, it's, yeah, you need the these days, doesn't it? These days, it's virtually illegal to be English and proud. And, uh, and there it is. That is up there with the most unhinged headlines of the year so far. But I do think, for my money, it's still just... A, I don't know, actually... But just ahead of the pack, it's got to be the EU would rather destroy the planet than let Brexit succeed, which appeared last week. We're, we, do you know, we are in. These are, these are, these are vintage days. This is, this is a vintage weeks for unhinged headlines. We're in a really purple period for vintage headlines. This is, this is like, if I knew enough about wine, I would say that 2024 for unhinged headlines is like 1943 for a, a, a Chateau Lafitte or a Mouton Rothschild or, um, or whatever I uh, should have come up with. 12.53 is the time. It's like, it's, it's, yes, it is. It's like the Hacienda was for dance music and, and culture in the early 1990s and late 1980s. So the Daily Telegraph comment pages are for unhinged headlines in this period. I want to just quickly touch on something that fits into the unhinged headline phenomenon because um, one of the target areas for these uh, very, very strange people who almost always have links back to Tufton Street and its, its, its various satellites is actually now, it's now become British history. Kemi Badenoch publishing an article um, which earned the headline, UK's wealth isn't from white privilege and colonialism, trying to essentially argue that slavery or, or, or colonialism or imperialism or whatever you want to call it had played a minimal uh, to the point of trivial role in the establishment of the um, of Great Britain's economic wealth and power going right back to, to the 17th century. It, and it, it caught the eye of, of Alan Lester, who's a professor of historical geography at the University of Sussex and adjunct professor of history at La Trobe University in Melbourne. So supremely unqualified to comment on these matters, really, compared 
to Cami Badenoch. But but it, it's fair to say, Alan, that this this narrative has rather got your goat. Would you tell us why? Yeah, thanks very much, James. Hi. It wasn't actually so much uh, exactly Kemi Badenoch's words. I mean, she was speaking in the, the City of London and talking to financiers about the role of 1688 in the glorious revolution, creating all the conditions for financial security in Britain. And that's fair enough. You know, no, no historians will really argue with her that that was one important contribution to Britain's economic success. But then she went on to talk about uh, people talking about colonialism all the mm. time and, as you say, minimising its role. And then she said developing nations don't understand how the West became rich. And if they don't understand, they can't follow in its footsteps. And um, that <laughs> is denialism. <laughs> that, that's, that's moving on from a valid historical point to deny uh, something else which was an enormous contributor to Britain's uh, economic prosperity, you know, wealth, power, dominance of the oceans, dominance of trade, and so on. So to just sort of breezily dismiss the empire as, you know, a source of Britain's economic standing is ridiculous. But it, it, after Badenoch's speech, things like got night, worse. Like night following day, Alan, who popped up <laughs> next? <laughs> the IEA. No, uh, the Institute of Economic of Affairs. Economic affairs? <laughs> Surely and not. Knows, yeah, knows so much about economic affairs that it was behind this trussy's wonderful mini budget. Hallelujah. So <laughs> they popped up in the Telegraph, taking the denialism a stage further. And this was the point of which I, I thought, you know, enough is enough. It's, it's time to say something, which I did on, on Twitter, yeah. um, to, to combat this, this denialism. And, you know, I started off by pointing out the techniques that are used, um, which will be very familiar to you, <laughs> the sort of cherry picking of sources. Um, and even one of the sources that was cherry picked, you know, the, the best they could do was to, to minimise the contribution of empire by saying that colonies only contributed 15% of the uh, investment in Britain, which to me is, is not something to be sort of... <laughs> no, I mean, it, it, it's, it's implausibly low, but even if it were true, it's still a, a significant chunk of uh, domestic yeah, investment. Sure. Yeah, and it's likely to have been much, much higher. I mean, part of the problem here is that you know a lot of this is grounds for legitimate historical debate, and you know economic historians have debated the size and the significance of imperial contributions, you know, which vary through trade and tariff protections and so on, for a long time. But there is no doubt whatsoever that the ability of Britons to take other people's lands, backed up by military force, to grow commodities, you know, commercial crops on those lands, to have free, in the case of slavery, or very cheap labour supplied to them, in the case of conquered people or indentured labour, at the point of a bayonet in many cases, that that enabled British prosperity. <laughs> and you know, to try to deny this is, is absurd. And it, and it speaks to a broader narrative as well, which, of course, has encompassed the National Trust in recent years, certainly in recent months. This, this attempt to complain almost about history, uh, about the reporting of history, about actual history and, and claim it's almost the historical equivalent of Kellyanne Conway's alternative facts, isn't it? Is it, is it motivated by a similar impulse? Uh, you know, the, 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 the kind of MAGA white supremacism is motivated by a similar impulse to this form of fairly grim historical revisionism. I, uh, I think there are very similar things at, at play, and, and indeed there are connections via Tufton Street, as, as, yeah. as you mentioned. So some of these groups involved in attacks on the National Trust, and, you know, this organisation called Restore Trust, now a private company, um, are linked in with, with Tufton Street and with the sort of shady finance that sustains it. And much of it is uh, rather cynical, culture war politicking. What, what, what does that uh, mean? What, what are they trying? What is the what is the sort of goal, as it were? To... Yeah, well, I, I think you know, I, I tried to write about some of this, how empire features in yes. the culture war in, in a book called Deny and Disavow. And the, the conclusion I came to was that there's, there's two major things going on. One is the short term politicking that, you know, the Tories won red wall seats from Labour in 2019. They have betrayed all the promises that they made 
to get those seats in terms of Brexit dividends mm. and levelling up and so on. What's left is the perceived social conservatism uh, of voters in those seats. It's right. pride in Britishness. It's, you know, the waving the Union Jack. It's being unashamed of anything to do with our imperial past and to yeah. challenge those who would question those celebratory narratives and so on. So I think that's one thing, you know, that there's a kind of short-term politicking to, win, to retain those Red Wall seats. But underlying that, and the reason why it can be successful, is the natural conservatism of you know of, of people who don't like uh, challenging narratives of their past, um, confronting them. You know, we, we all have a sort of psychological predisposition to take pride in our national past, yes, we do. Um, and and that's being challenged more and more as things like. The significance of the slave so it's trade. Like a rear, it's like a rear guard action almost to, to coin a yeah. military phrase against reality or, or against accuracy. You mentioned your, your, one of your books. I know you've got, um, there's a book you've edited coming out next month, isn't there? The Truth About Empire Real Histories of British Colonialism. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, that, that's a group of 14 um, professional historians and Satnam Sanghera, who recently wrote Empire World, has written the foreword for it. And it really does arise out of this sort of collective exasperation that we are not as we are portrayed in papers like The Telegraph. You know, academic historians trying to find out truths about the colonial past are simply doing that. We're trying to get as close as possible to the truth of Britain's imperial history. And that truth is sometimes horrendous. You know, it involves military conquest, it involves invasion, it involves dispossession, it involves exploitation. All of these things were a part of the British Empire as much as they were any other empire in world history. And yet, when we write about these things within this sort of context of culture war, mm. we're described as woke, leftist, <laughs> cultural Marxists. Uh, I've been described as being influenced by CRT, which I had to look up because you know, all of my work has been based in the archives of the British Empire itself. <laughs> you know, it's, it's those empirical documents from British colonists. Uh, so I had to look up what critical race theory was, since it's never had any impact on my writing at all. But you know, within the culture war, what we do as historians is now being politicised in a way. I mean, the empire's always been politicised. There's always been you know, people course. attempting to defend its legitimacy. But we're, we're going through a particular peak moment uh, and and, and, and uh, dis distorting. I, we, we, we're out of time. I, that's what one of the reasons I got you on is is is, is, is to, to to push back against some of the misrepresentation, misreporting that you are dealing with and we'll, we'll definitely talk again and I'd, I'd refer everyone to this new book that's out next month The Truth About Empire Real Histories of British Colonialism you, you don't have to have an emotional investment in it you don't have to feel personal. Yeah, sorry, Sheila Fogarty's here, and it's already one minute past one. <laughs> okay. You have to have an emotional investment in Sheila Fogarty. You absolutely You do. know all the business about the Global Player app. Tom Swarbrick's with you at four. Here's Sheila. James O'Brien on LBC. 